Honourable Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. And I believe um, we have a tabling of a report, Senator Urquhart. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, I present Human Rights Scrutiny Report 6 of 2022 and move that consideration of the report be listed on the notice paper as an order of the day. And the question is the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. And I believe there's some messages from the House. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the Appropriation Bill No. 1, 2022-23, and two related bills for concurrence. I call the Minister. Realities may be taken together and be now read a first time. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator McAllister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Appropriation Bill Number no. One, 2022-23. Appropriation Bill Number no. Two, 2022-23. Appropriation Parliamentary Departments Bill Number no. One, 2022-23. I call the minister. I move that these bills be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. So the question is that the motion is put by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The president has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the High Speed Rail Authority Bill 2022. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for Senator Brown. Is leave granted? There's no objection. Leave is granted. Senator I move Urquhart. that leave of absence be granted to Senator Brown for today for personal reasons. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Cadell. Leave to move a motion relating to a leave of absence. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Cadell. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Hume for 25 November for personal reasons. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Cadell be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I'll now call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Treasury Laws Amendment Electric Car Discount Bill 2022, further consideration in committee. Senators, the committee is considering the Treasury Laws Amendment Electric Cars Discount Bill 2022. The question that we are currently considering is that Amendments 1 and 2 on Sheet 1745 revised be agreed to, and that was moved by Senator Pocock. 
Does any senator wish to make a contribution? Senator Rice. Yes, thank you, Acting Chair or Deputy Chair. Um, I did actually have one further question, which came to me as I was riding my bike into Parliament this morning, as to whether bicycles or indeed electric bicycles are covered under this legislation. Because it would seem to me that if you're offering fringe benefits tax exemptions, that that would be a very sensible thing. And for a lot of people, particularly electric bikes, people are choosing to purchase an electric bike rather than a, a second car often and um, something that we really should be encouraging. And certainly bicycles, pedal-powered, human-powered ones, are the ultimate um, zero emissions vehicles. Um, electric bicycles, which of course, if they are powered by renewable energy, um, similarly are zero emissions vehicles. Minister. Um, uh, I do appreciate the question, and you're right that there are a range of ways that we can reduce transport emissions and electric uh, bicycles offer a number of um, one, one of many options that would assist us in uh, reducing emissions from the transport sector. Um, I'll seek advice from officials about the applicability of the measure to electric bicycles. But essentially, I suppose my baseline observation is that the measure essentially seeks to adjust. Uh, an existing set of arrangements that apply to the way that fringe benefit tax uh, acts when an employer makes a car available for the private use of an employee. The answer to your question is essentially contingent on whether those existing arrangements apply at the moment to uh, electric bicycles. And I'll seek some advice and come back to you shortly. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, I understand there are a number of uh, Australian companies uh, converting uh, internal combustion engine vehicles to become EVs for fleets and for the mining sector. I just wanted to confirm that they will be able to access uh, this FBT discount. Minister. Uh, thanks very much, Senator Pocock, and I appreciate your interest in this area. Um, essentially, vehicles' uh, eligibility is determined by the eligibility criteria. This measure only applies to cars, um, so if the, um, it would be dependent on the circumstances, um, principally on whether or not the vehicle that was thus created was a car. Um, for the purposes of fringe benefits tax. Um, as I understand it, there are a set of thresholds that define a car and distinguish it from a sort of a more heavy purpose um, vehicle. And I understand that amongst that criteria is carrying capacity of a ton. Um, so it would be dependent on the specific vehicle that was being manufactured or, or, or produced. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Minister. But if, if they are light light road vehicles, that they will be covered. So say your, your Hiluxes, your, those sorts of vehicles. Minister. I understand that it, it, it's essentially dependent, Senator Poker, on whether it meets the definition of a car um, for the purposes of fringe benefit tax. Um, it would also, of course, need to be under the luxury car tax threshold, which is one of the other criteria that applies to eligibility for this measure. Are there any other contributions at this time? Senator Rice? Um, well, I was interested in whether we have a response to my question. And if electric bicycles um, aren't covered under this um, legislation, I was wondering whether the government would favourably consider amendments to include electric bicycles to also be available to this fringe benefits tax um, measure. Minister. Thanks, Senator Rice. I'm advised that because fringe benefit tax would not ordinarily apply, or these arrangements wouldn't ordinarily apply to um, an electric bicycle, um, we wouldn't expect that the measure before the Senate today does provide benefits for people who, who have an electric bicycle. But uh, in answer to your broader question about whether the government is 
interested in the contribution that electric bicycles might make to reducing transport emissions, that would be something we would contemplate as part of the broader electric vehicle strategy. You'll know, I think, that the government has commenced consultation on that. We've received many hundreds of submissions and we're working through those at the moment. Are there any other contributions? Because I'll put the question. I put the question that the amendments be agreed to. The amendments are one and two on sheet 1745, as moved by Senator Pocock. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. No. Division required. Division requested. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question before the chair 
is that amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 1745 as revised be agreed to and was moved by Senator Pocock. Those with the question for the ayes pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the ayes Senator Shikoni and teller for the noes Senator Cadell. One Senators, there being 29 ayes and 25 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. Does any honourable senator wish to make any further contribution in the Committee of the Whole? No senator has indicated they wish to make a further contribution, so I intend to put the questions. The question is that the bill, as amended, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye, against no. The ayes have it. The question is now that the bill be reported. Those for the question say aye, against no. The ayes have it. Honourable Senators, the committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment Electric Car Discount Bill 2022 and agreed to it with, amem with amendments. Minister. I move that the report be adopted. Those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. I put the question, those, those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Clark. No? Okay. I've been. Honourable Senator has been asked to to put the question again. I've been asked to put the question again on the third that the bill read a third time. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Division is required. Ring the bells.
Order. I lock the door. So the question is that <coughs> the Treasury Laws Amendment Electric Car Discount Bill 2022 Bill, uh, as moved by Senator McAllister, be read a third time. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone as teller for the ayes and Senator Cattell as teller for the noes. <coughs> Order. There being 31 ayes and 24 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Fringe Benefits Tax Assessment Act 1986 to exempt benefits relating to cars that are zero or low emissions vehicles and for other purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Biosecurity Amendment Strengthening Biosecurity Bill 2022. Resumption of second reading debate. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Biosecurity Amendment Strengthening Biosecurity Bill 2022 and to inform the Chamber that the coalition parties will be supporting um, the government's efforts uh, in this regard. The Federal Coalition supports the passage of the Biosecurity Amendment Strengthening Biosecurity Bill 2022. We support this legislation because it will amend the Biosecurity Act 2015, with measures that will enhance the operation of Australia's national biosecurity framework. It will strengthen the management of risks across maritime and aviation pathways, improve the efficiency of the Act and increase a range of civil and criminal penalties for breaches of biosecurity law. Also, the passage of this bill will address recommendations made by the Inspector-General of Biosecurity in his review of the Ruby Princess incident and the New South Wales Special Commission of Inquiry. Significantly, this bill is similar to legislation introduced last year by the Federal Coalition. It's absolutely fantastic uh, to see the Labor Party, particularly in an area of policy where they don't have a lot of strength, where stakeholders are probably traditionally don't put their faith and store in a Labor government, and that being the policy area of um, agriculture, uh, that to see the Labor Party doing the right thing and actually adopting the coalition legislation that lapsed as a result of the election 
uh, and to be re-presenting it here to the Senate. So, you know, Senator Watt, as you exit the chamber, um, it's great to be able to stand up as myself, a former agriculture minister, and to see that we are doing the right uh, thing as a chamber, Senator Ciccone, backing tight. To Senator McKenzie, Senator Ciccone is on his feet with a point of order. Another I don't mean to interrupt the good senator, but it is um, against standing orders to reflect on senators that are walking out of the chamber. Keep it in mind, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you. You have the call. Thank you. Um, but it is, uh, you know, I'm going to call out good behaviour when I see it. And so every single time the Labor Party, and there has been a few instances of late, uh, chooses to adopt coalition policy positions, um, to put forward legislation in this place uh, that we were actually draft, had drafted or that had lapsed in the last parliament. You know, we're very, very happy that they uh, support that and know that it's going to be good for our country. And there's no other area that we can invest more in to protect our, our future prosperity and sustainability, not just as a nation but particularly for rural and regional Australians, is in biosecurity uh, itself. The bill will increase protection from diseases and pests by implementing measures that manage biosecurity risks from travellers, including responding to the threat of foot and mouth disease being introduced into Australia from the footwear and clothing of travellers. Now, if the Federal Labor Party had have, uh, been more robust in supporting this legislation when it had the coalition's name on it, it would have been a lot easier for the now Agriculture Minister to direct travellers returning from Bali in June, July, uh, August this year with the threat of foot and mouth disease, direct them specifically to, that they had to uh, walk through those foot baths, etc., and a whole raft of other measures to increase um, our biosecurity but, and also decrease the risk of such a disease getting into Australia. So better late than never. Uh, so well done, Minister Watt, on finally getting this uh, before the Senate. While this is welcoming, welcome, it is worth recognising that it was the Federal Coalition who was calling for foot mats to be installed and the NFF, I might say, at international airports once foot and mouth was detected in Bali, given the increased risk of travellers. And it was Minister Watt and the Federal Labor Party that was sort of standing up saying that wasn't needed and people coming back for Bali were in thongs and so they didn't want to go through the foot and baths because it was going to hurt their feet. Well, I can tell you. No, no, I'm happy for those senators, Madam Chair. Senators, so, so senators, I'm happy. Senator Mackenzie. Senators are reminded of the need to be orderly. Interjections are disorderly. Senator Mackenzie, please resume. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your protection. Um, I'm happy for those uh, senators who can't recall that classic interview of the minister? I think it was on Sky, but you know, I'll, I'll search my records. I will, I will send Senator McCarthy and Senator Jaconi and any other uh, government senator that doesn't believe that the agriculture minister uh, was more concerned about uh, Australian travellers coming back from Bali wearing thongs and what these chemicals may do to their precious feet than he was in protecting. Australia's livestock industry from foot and mouth disease. But you know, I'll leave that for another day. I will return to the bill before us. So it's good uh, that they're now in place. But this government flip-flopped about whether to install the mats in the first place, and by the time they did, uh, it was uh, way too long. In the weeks that it took for your government to make up their minds and take action, over 79 thousand international travellers arrived in Australia from Indonesia, 93.4 per cent of those from Bali, without having to disinfect their shoes, without having to go through a raft of measures to provide security to Australian producers and, indeed, the future prosperity of this um, trade. I mean, one of our great, great um, gold stars internationally is that we are foot and mouth disease free which means that our primary produce can um, require a higher price in international markets. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. But that only works as long as we keep foot and mouth disease out. So sorry if I'm not going to share the great offence of the Labor Party that people's precious little feet are being, you know, 
impacted by measures that will actually protect this great industry and our future um, trade prospects. In a positive move, this bill will strengthen um, pre-approval reporting by ensuring that pre-arrival reporting requirements of the Biosecurity Act will be expanded to ensure that accurate and up-to-date information is available to assess biosecurity risk, including the human health risk of arriving vessels and aircraft. Penalties for operators and people in charge of aircraft and vessels who do not comply with these requirements will be expanded and strengthened. The importance of having a strong biosecurity system should never be underestimated. In 2020, the value of Australia's biosecurity system was estimated to be $314 billion over the next five decades. So it's absolutely essential that compliance with our national biosecurity laws and frameworks is always maintained, that we never become complacent about this. Uh, and it's, it's not sexy. People, you know, you won't be finding uh, Victorians in marginal seats this weekend uh, casting their votes for or against Premier Daniel Andrews' um, re-election, and I hope not. I hope not, Senator Ciccone, uh, that Victorians will make a, a cast their vote for a positive future uh, in my home state of Victoria. So this, but this won't be one of the topics that they think about, because it is out of sight, out of mind. Uh, but it is critical for our future uh, economic prosperity that we, uh, as legislators, keep our mind and eyes focused on keeping this framework as strong uh, as, and robust as possible. It's absolutely essential that compliance with our national biosecurity laws and framework is always maintained and that the penalties in place reflect the seriousness of the risk. They're going to destroy people's lives and livelihoods and future um, prosperity. We need to throw the book at these people, and not just the individual travellers who are breaching the framework, but the operators that are responsible for ensuring um, that travellers are fully informed of the risk, are fully informed of their responsibility on return uh, or on entry to our country. So importantly, this bill will increase the penalties for those who do the wrong thing. People who put at risk our biosecurity system by failing to comply with these new requirements will face civil penalties of up to 120 penalty units, or $26,640. That's, that's, you know, that's a few trips to Bali if you get it wrong. A lot of thongs. A lot of thongs. So please fill out. Uh, it's, yep. You're going to be hit with a massive fine if you don't take our biosecurity framework as seriously as we do, um, and that's a good thing. Those who deliberately conceal risk goods will face stiffer penalties of up to 5,000 bucks. So uh, when you tick the card when you're coming back into Australia and do you have any meat products or animal products um, in your luggage, if you've stuffed the meat pie, the Hungry Jack's burger in your carry-on luggage, that's concealing meat products. So that's going to be a very, very, very expensive um, you know, whopper with cheese. It's going to cost you $5,000. And so it should. Because, you know, this is important stuff. And I think for those people who aren't linked to rural and regional Australia, who don't understand how important the livestock industry is um, to our national economy, but also um, Particularly to local economies, they don't think they don't realise uh, what they're doing, and so I hope that operators of vessels and of aircraft will make it very, very clear to their travellers the risk if they think, oh well, it's just a ham sandwich, it's just a ham sandwich that I didn't finish. I'll save that for the bus trip, the Sky Bus, back into Melbourne because the Labor Party hasn't uh, built our our airport to CBD rail yet, um, so they're going to have to get on that sky bus. I'll save that ham sandwich for then. Don't. Declare it, because, again, that will be a very, very expensive ham sandwich. For operators, the increased penalties are up to 222000 for an individual and up to $1.1 million for corporate bodies. And the remaining measures in the bill will simplify the process for making decisions, identifying prohibited conditionally non-prohibited and suspended goods or granting permits based on risk assessment. 
The bill will allow the Agriculture Minister and the Health Minister to authorise expenditure on biosecurity-related programs to increase efficiency and allow more transparency of such expenditure. More effective sharing of information with government agencies and other bodies will be secured, whilst ensuring necessary confidentiality. It will also improve the operation of provisions relating to approved arrangements and compensation. Overall, these are sensible measures um, that the Federal Coalition will be supporting. Australia's biosecurity system is a crucial pillar in our national defence, helping us to prepare for, protect against and respond to risks to our environment, economy and way of life. Our nation has enjoyed a reputation for clean, healthy and disease-free agricultural production systems through our natural advantage of geographic isolation. This has also given our producers an edge in a very competitive international environment, and this rock-solid reputation is not something we should ever put at risk. We need a strong biosecurity system because, in 2020, Australia's environmental assets were valued at a staggering $5.7 trillion over the next five decades, and they cannot be replaced. We are a unique nation, continent, with a unique flora and fauna heritage that is completely at risk if we do not keep um, pest and disease out. Um, and so uh, we also need to ensure that our great ag agricultural production, which is projected to reach $82 billion in 2022-23, supports 1.6 million Australians uh, at work. 1.6 million Australians can thank our fabulous agriculture industry for their job. And that industry is very much premised, and its success and future prosperity is premised on keeping pest and disease out in an increasingly competitive global market. And before COVID, tourism itself contributed $50 billion to our GDP. There's a lot of people, a lot of planes, a lot of vessels, a lot of people coming to our shore, all of them representing a risk to our biosecurity framework. So it's important to point this out because the health of all these sectors rely on a strong and robust biosecurity system. We are very, very proud as a coalition of our track record uh, when we were in government because we made it a priority. In 2023, we made more than $1 billion available for biosecurity and export programs, an increase of 69 per cent from 14-15. In government, we also increased fines for people breaking biosecurity laws. And I was very, very uh, happy as minister to hand a few of those out and ensure that um, people that did the wrong thing were fined appropriately and are unable to return to our country within time frames um, for doing the wrong thing, because for not treating our nation with the respect that we deserve. Given the increased risks at our border, with a major foot and mouth disease outbreak in Indonesia, threats of varroa mite, and lumpy skin disease, the Federal Coalition will always lend our support to outcomes that will strengthen our biosecurity uh, system because we are a world leader. Um, we commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, thank you. Senator Cadell. Chamber. Clark. Clark. Uh, quorum not present. Ring the bells.
Quorum present. Stop the bells. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you. That was an unusual calling of quorum, <laughs> Senator. Um, anyway, uh, we, it, it, you managed to disrupt a few, uh, a few spillover estimate sessions. But, um, so I'm on my feet uh, on behalf of the Australian Greens to support the biosecurity amendment strengthening biosecurity bill 2022. And I must say, uh, Acting Deputy President, I nearly had a double take uh, listening to Senator McKenzie talk about the importance of Australia's environmental assets their trillions of dollars worth of value and how we have to do everything to protect our Australian environmental assets. Well, you won't get any disagreement from the Australian Greens on that very important point, but I do note that uh, our biosecurity risks are directly correlated to our changing climate. Uh, and that no one has done more than the National Party in this country to ruin a decade of action on climate change. And I would bring uh, the Nationals' attention back to that specific point. If they actually care about strengthening uh, biosecurity, they would uh, both act on mitigating emissions uh, in, in line with at least the Paris Protocol and, of course, uh, put in place a number of adaption measures. I'd also note that the Australian Greens are very aware that Senator McKenzie said there was a billion, that under her government a billion dollars was made available for biosecurity arrangements. And I asked at estimates last week roughly how much money was spent on the, you know, the overall biosecurity expenditure, and the department said around a couple of hundred million dollars a year, Senator. Uh, and then when we drilled down into how much is actually spent on environmental risks, in other words, biosecurity risks specifically to the environment, for example, to threatened species, uh, there's a fund for $800,000. Uh, the rest of that funding is pretty much targeted at industry. Uh, so there's a big imbalance there that we've actually got to deal with because, yes, it's important to look after our industry, and I agree with what Senator McKenzie said there about our agricultural sector and our exports, but we've also got to look after our environment. So I would uh, draw the Senator's attention to that. Um, we support the, the bill today. However, uh, unlike the Nationals, uh, and I heard nothing at all from their contribution uh, or the LNP, and presumably the Labor Party, we have some significant problems with this legislation. And if I had my way, we would have been putting up substantive amendments today to deal with uh, some issues in this legislation in, in committee. Uh, and we would have been seeking, uh, we were seeking actually, um, and I'm happy to, to mention, but we have brought this up with uh, Mr Littleproud's office and I've brought this up with my colleagues across the chamber. Um, I draw Senator's attention to uh, the scrutiny of bills, uh, Digest 722 and page, page 49 to page 55. And they draw the attention of the Senate uh, and, and various committees to the appropriateness of exempting instruments made under proposed section 196A in this uh, legislation, proposed section 196B and proposed section 393b from the usual parliamentary disallowance processes and including no invalidity clauses at proposed section 196a and 393b in other words uh, you know to put it simply this bill is walking away this chamber this commonwealth parliament to disallow instruments it's actually insulting that the agricultural minister somehow feels that we can't do our job. Uh, and I think all senators would agree none of us should be supporting measures to reduce the power of the Senate to scrutinise ministers and departments. That's our job. That is why we're here. It is why we're elected. It is bread and butter, plain vanilla work for us. And yet here before us, while we, these, 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 this bill is very important and we support what's in it, it shouldn't be beyond the scrutiny of this chamber. So I'll give you a little bit more detail on that. Um, this, the Scrutiny Digest 6 of 20, 2022, um, the committee requested the minister's advice as to why it is both necessary and appropriate to include no invalidity clauses in proposed sections 196A and 393B, and whether the bill could be amended to provide that determinations made under proposed section 196A, 196B or 390B. 3B are subject to disallowance to ensure they receive appropriate parliamentary oversight. Now, I won't go through the, the details because I don't have enough time in 10 minutes, but the minister responded 
uh, in relation to the no invalidity clauses, uh, that that kind of power was necessary, um, and that the, uh, the he advised that the intended section 196A 393B determinations would be made in a consultative manner in all but exceptional circumstances, and he of course talked about biosecurity threats being urgent and emerging, and that need to respond immediately. Uh, and then, in terms of exemptions from disallowance, the minister considered that exemptions from the disallowance process within the bill are appropriate, and does, did not propose to amend the bill to remove the exemptions. In other words, to to pass them, but make them disallowable in case the Senate wanted to scrutinise those. Uh, and he basically said they are decisions that are scientific and technical in nature, critical to the effective management of biosecurity risks, and may enable emergency action to manage a threat or harm from a biosecurity risk. Since when is this chamber and our committee process uh, not, up to, not up to scratch in terms of uh, dealing with legislation which we get nearly every day in this place, uh, where we have decisions in the legislation that are scientific and technical in nature? Really? How did you guys miss this? Why weren't you concerned about this? Well, I'm, I'm glad you are, but you, I tell you what, Mr. Littleproud wasn't concerned about it, uh, and nor were some of your colleagues uh, across the chamber. Um, and it, the minister gives a couple of other a couple of other points. Uh, he noted that determinations would be made on the basis of expert technical and scientific assessments that determine whether a particular pest or disease poses an unacceptable level of biosecurity risk. And the minister considered that subjecting these determinations to the disallowance process has the potential to jeopardise the effectiveness of decision making and risk management processes. Again, we, do, we, we get that every day, and just about every piece of legislation we've passed in the last couple of days has technical matters and scientific advice in it. Um, he noted there were some safeguards in the bill. Uh, he also noted that disallowance would be inappropriate because it could generate uncertainty. In other words, having the Senate and the Commonwealth Parliament scrutinise regulations could create uncertainty. Well, of course it could. But once again, it's our job to do this. It is bread and butter work for us as senators. Um, and he, he gave more information there. He considered that a 15-sitting-day disallowance period would give rise to considerable uncertainty around business requirements, among other things, as disallowance would take effect immediately upon the passing of the motion. Now, that's actually a little bit misleading. That would be the passing of the motion to actually disallow, if it was disallowed by the Senate. When disallowances are tabled in this place, they're effective immediately. Now, this is a, perhaps a, an interesting question for some senators. Um, in, the last, in the years from 2010 to 2019, does anyone know how many, how many disallowances were, or pieces of regulation came before this Senate that were actually disallowed? Thousands. Thousands. How many were actually disallowed out of the thousands that were brought before the Senate? Seventeen. And I know a couple of those specifically. There was very good reason for that. So, out of the thousands of disallowance or disallowable instruments that have come before this chamber in the last decade, only 17 were disallowed. And yet the minister feels it's going to you know, create uncertainty in relation to this legislation. I do want to bring senators' attention to this. I don't have time to go into it. But the Scrutiny of Bills Committee made it really clear in responding to the minister's response um, that you know, this, the committee re reiterates its view that simply stating that a matter is technically complex or has significant policy implications is not an adequate justification for removing democratic oversight over a law of the Commonwealth or reducing the scrutiny of the Commonwealth Parliament. Uh, it is not clear from the committee, to the committee for the minister's explanation why the minister considers that it is appropriate to exempt an instrument from disallowance merely because of considerations that go into making that instrument are scientific or technical. And it gives a lot of examples of other uh, instruments that we've had before the Senate that we, we haven't raised these, or no minister has raised these issues. Um, he also goes on to say that in relation to the minister's advice that the allowing the usual disallowance process to apply to instruments made under proposed section 196A, 196B and 393B would create an unacceptable level of uncertainty. The committee acknowledges that, yes, there's, that there's some uncertainty, um, but this is our lawmaking system. This is how we make laws in this country. So I think I've said enough on this, um, and I, 
as I mentioned, I, I do, I, if, if we'd had support from across the chamber, we would have moved a substantive amendment on this. But I just want to get the Greens' concerns on record that this is a slippery slope for us as a chamber uh, and as a Commonwealth Parliament when we when we walk we so easily walk away from our role and our scrutiny of critical legislation. We support what's in this. We support what's in this, but we support our right to have a period of time to do more work on it, to seek commitment from stakeholders. And let's be honest, we're under a lot of pressure to pass a lot of legislation this week and next week. We haven't had a lot of time to seek and consult on the back of this. It would have probably been perfectly fine to have passed this and had them as disallowable instruments and they would have immediately gone into law and very unlikely would have been disallowed. So I think we all agree we need better biosecurity laws. The Greens have been very supportive of the current inquiry into biosecurity threats. We uh, lobbied to get Veromite included into that, uh, that uh, in uh, ongoing inquiry, which uh, I I'm, I'm part of in the Rural and Regional Affairs Committee. Uh, you know, we absolutely support the need for better biosecurity laws, but we do not support reducing the power of the Senate. That is what we are. We are senators. This is our job, and I want to get that on record today. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And uh, at the outset, if I could say, uh, I do support uh, the bill, and that is certainly the opposition's position. Uh, however, I also support everything that Senator Wish Wilson just said in relation to the scrutiny process. And uh, I think this is an issue. Uh, which is going to be progressed in some form uh, over this life of this parliament in a way that um, all senators all senators in this place need to closely reflect upon it now uh, because there will become a time when uh, these matters in relation to biosecurity legislation indeed any other legislation that exempts uh, instruments from a disallowance process are going to have to be considered by each and every senator in this place, because Senator Wish Wilson is absolutely correct. This chamber has a scrutiny role. We have a scrutiny role that is part of our function in Australia's parliamentary democracy, and I'm deeply concerned at the systemic nature in which uh, instruments are put forward through various pieces of legislation which are not subject to the disallowance process. And just perhaps uh, uh, for those who may be listening to this debate, to uh, tease out the importance of this issue. We have a piece of legislation which comes before this place, and we all vote on that piece of legislation. And that piece of legislation then gives the executive, the ministers, the ability to make instruments, issue delegated legislation. And that delegated legislation can have a material impact on the freedoms, the lives of people in our society. There's a process called a disallowance process, which means each piece of that delegated legislation is scrutinised by a committee of this place called the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee, and an assessment is made as to whether or not it's constitutional, as to whether or not it falls within the powers of the piece of legislation under which it was made, as to whether or not sufficient consultation was made with all relevant stakeholders, as to whether or not it's clear on the face of it or is it uncertain. And that scrutiny process is extraordinarily important extraordinarily important. And in my experience in the last parliament and this parliament, serving on both of the scrutiny uh, committees, that process leads to better law. It leads to better law. And we have all seen firsthand how when that scrutiny process is mobilised, instruments are amended, additional consultation may be made, instruments can be withdrawn because of scrutiny concerns which are raised by this chamber. So the arguments in relation to this matter whereby uh, the minister and, and the department uh, are making uh, arguments that the instruments under this act uh, should not be subject to disallowance process are not persuasive, and they actually undercut our system of parliament because, and our system of democracy, because it is our role as senators. It is our role as senators to scrutinise the laws which are made. And when this chamber doesn't have the power doesn't have the power to initiate that disallowance process, then that scrutiny role is undercut. And as Senator Wish Wilson said, it is very, very rare. It is very, very rare for instruments to be subject to disallowance motions and to actually be disallowed. For the very reason that the scrutiny committee engages 
in a process with the relevant minister, with the department, to make sure that the relevant instrument complies with the scrutiny principles. So it is very rare for an instrument to be disallowed. So I've said it previously in this chamber. Um, I'll say it as long as I'm in this chamber that instruments which are made by ministers, made by departments under various pieces of legislation should be subject to disallowance processes. And I agree with Senator Wish Wilson that the argument that something is particularly scientific or technical and therefore senators in this place don't have the capacity in, to, to assess it doesn't wash. It doesn't wash. It's not persuasive. All of us are considering legislation every day which is based on a whole range of different evidence, including scientific and technical evidence, commercial evidence, social evidence. That's our job. That's our job. And there is a, there is a latent paternalism, a latent paternalism in the concept that, oh well, we can't let it go to the senators because we might not get the result we want. And from my perspective, from my perspective, um, that is simply inappropriate, and it's up to us as senators to push back at that. Now, I would have personally liked to have seen perhaps this to have been uh, one occasion where those arguments could have been further prosecuted. But there are time constraints, and I think it is important. I think it is important that the scrutiny committees actually act um, with a degree of uh, unanimity in terms of pushing these matters forward uh, in order to maximise the opportunity for the best result. And certainly, that is something which I personally will be, um, will be working towards, and hopefully with the support of other senators. I do want to take this opportunity to read some of the um, excerpts from the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Senate Standing Committee report inquiry into the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight. And I think these quotes from leading experts, Australian experts, underlines the importance of the points made by Senator Wish Wilson and the points which I'm making here today. So I go to page 29, and this is a quote from Professor Toomey, who's Australia's leading, one of Australia's leading constitutional law experts. And I quote: Legislative power is conferred upon Parliament by the Constitution. And to abdicate that power, to abdicate that power would be to breach that constitutional conferral of power on Parliament. Accordingly, Parliament must retain control over its delegated legislative power and be in a position to supervise the exercise of delegated legislative powers in order to be effective in exercising that control. Professor Toomey argues the mechanism of control and supervision is the process of tabling and disallowance." End quote. That's Professor Ian Toomey, a leading Australian constitutional expert. I give another quote from this report in section 3.44. And this is a quote from uh, Professor Kristen Rundle, co-director Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies from Melbourne Law School. And this is her quote. Disallowance is not just a technical process that your committee can instigate. It's actually a principle, a principle that serves the operation of our constitutional order, and specifically the centrality of Parliament's lawmaking powers within it. It is not simply a presumption that can be rebutted when convenient." End quote. And that is my concern in this case. And Senator Ciccone serves on um, uh, at least one of the scrutiny committees. I can't remember, I'm not sure if you serve on both of them with me. But, um, and, and Senator Ciccone will be well familiar with, um, with these arguments. It cannot be rebutted just when convenient. And that, that's what we're hearing from the relevant department in this case. I'll give you another quote from this report. Uh, and that is this, uh, again from Professor Toomey. Parliament would completely abdicate its responsibility if it was unable to change the laws that provided for the delegated legislation. And so it goes on. A quote from, again, Chris, Professor Kristen Rundle. And, and I think this really sums it up. I think this really, really sums it up and underlines the, the concern I have that there's been this systemic shift over time to make delegated legislation not subject to the disallowance process and therefore not subject to the scrutiny of the Senate. And I quote, there's a cultural shift needed here, back towards the primacy of parliament, end quote. A cultural shift that's needed. And there is a cultural shift. And it does concern me deeply that we, as the elected representatives appearing here in the Senate to represent our communities, 
have our scrutiny role undercut, abdicated, eliminated if instruments aren't subject to disallowance? And just consider those disallowance principles, what they apply to, whether or not the instrument has been made in accordance with the Act. That's not a scientific or technical issue. That is, if a, if a minister issues an instrument under an Act, did the minister have the power to do that? Isn't that something we should expect the Senate to scrutinise? Why shouldn't the Senate scrutinise that? It's absurd, the argument, absolutely absurd, whether or not a constitutional power has been exercised. Isn't that something we should scrutinise here as the Senate? Doesn't that go to the core, the absolute core of our responsibilities? Whether or not there's been adequate consultation with respect to an instrument. Again, that goes to the core of our responsibilities. Has the minister consulted with members of our community who are going to be most impacted by these instruments? And so many people in the Australian community have been impacted by instruments made under the Biosecurity Act especially during the COVID pandemic. There needs to be consultation with respect to these instruments. Does the instrument inappropriately infringe upon the rights and liberties of Australian citizens? Isn't that something which we should be scrutinising? Of course it is. It can't be left to the departments. It can't be left to the executive in terms of the minister. There needs to be a check and balance. That's how our system works or should work. I'll just, uh, uh, in closing, I'll, I'll just refer to some of the, the arguments that sometimes used to justify this in terms of emergencies. We all understand that in certain biosecurity situations there can be an emergency and the department, the minister, needs to act quickly. The disallowance process does not prevent that because the instrument is issued, the action is taken, it has effect from the moment when the action is taken. What the disallowance process means is that once the instrument is issued, the exercise of that delegated legislation lawmaking power is then scrutinised. And if, if, in the unlikely event, and Senator Wish Wilson gave you the numbers, in the very unlikely event that the issue can't be resolved through discussions between the Senate, scrutiny committee and the minister, then there's a disallowance motion which is put on the floor of this Senate. And it's at that point that each and every one of the 76 senators here can make their own assessment with respect to the arguments as to whether or not the instrument should be in place or not. And that's our job. That's our job. And there will be scientific and technical arguments. Of course there will be. Of course there will be. There'll be financial arguments. There'll be social arguments. There'll be arguments with respect to people's freedoms and liberties, etc. Of course there will be. That's our job, and we do that every day. And it's only if. It is only if a majority of the senators in this place believe that instrument should be disallowed that it is disallowed. That's the only situation. That's the only situation in which it's disallowed, and that is an extremely rare event. And I would have thought that the Australian community would be very concerned, would be very concerned, if a majority of senators came to that view and were deprived were deprived of their ability to actually disallow an instrument in that circumstance. What does that say about our system? That if a majority of senators in this place believed an instrument was inappropriate and should be disallowed and were deprived of our ability to actually cast a vote and put that into action? It's a major concern. This is a systemic issue. It needs a solution. and uh, It's certainly something I um, I'm very uh, interested in pursuing discussions with uh, colleagues all across the chamber in order to rectify this matter, because it's simply not good enough. It's not good enough that we continue to see legislation introduced in this place which has instruments which are not subject to the disallowance processes and deprive the Australian people, deprive the Australian people of the scrutiny process which goes to the heart of this place. Goes to the heart of this place. So with that. Um, I'll conclude my comments there. Um, I know many of my friends in this chamber uh, I've, I've talked to about these issues and a lot of my concerns and, and Senator Wish Wilson's concerns, as he articulated, are shared by many in this chamber. And I, I just commend all senators to continue reflecting on this. And it's something we need to bring to a head at some stage. We need to bring it to a head and, and make some material action to assert the importance, assert the importance of this Senate and assert the importance of the scrutiny processes which go to the heart of our role. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, 
while I do support this bill and the increase in the strength in our biosecurity laws, given how critical biosecurity is to our country, we're a mega diverse country, an island nation, and we've seen the devastation of invasive species and diseases on our biodiversity, on agriculture, on our economy. But there are clearly real issues uh, with the lack of parliamentary oversight for some of the powers under this bill, as Senator Wish Wilson highlighted, and then Senator Scar. <laughs> this does not seem like the proper way to be making these sorts of laws, and it is incredibly disappointing after the uh, significant uh, concerns that were raised by the, uh, the scrutiny committees that the government has proceeded uh, with the plan to make um, parts of this bill un undisallowable. Legislative instruments should only be subject to disallowance in exceptional circumstances. Uh, and I think we see that. The, the Senate takes it very seriously when they seek to disallow um, a, re a regulation. And I accept that it is very unlikely that the delegated powers given to the minister under this bill will be, will be misused. But we need to recognise that our democratic system relies on parliamentary oversight, as Senator Scar so, so well laid out. And this oversight should never be given away lightly. And in this case, serious concerns have been raised. Uh, the Committee for Scrutiny of Bills raised concerns about the absence of parliamentary oversight in parts of this bill with the minister and the department. The minister responded, but the committee was not satisfied with the response. One justification provided by the minister was that the subject matter is too scientific and technical to be subjected to parliamentary oversight. I stand with the committee's emphatic rejection of this justification. Uh, to quote, uh, and I believe this has already been, been quoted, simply stating that a matter of technical, technically complex or, or has Simply saying that a matter is technically complex or has significant policy implications is not an adequate justification for removing democratic oversight over a law of the Commonwealth. The committee goes on. While it is often appropriate to delegate lawmaking powers to the executive in relation to technically co complex matters, it does not follow that such instruments should be sub subsequently be exempt from disallowance on that basis alone. A second justification offered by the minister is that oversight would create uncertainty. But it's completely unforeseeable that measures to increase biosecurity where a significant threat arises would be disallowed. There were only 17 instruments disallowed between 2010 and 2019. It, it seems completely unforeseeable that uh, for example, a regulation to increase the use of foot mats in response uh, to the increased risk of foot and mouth disease would be disallowed. Much of the questioning and talk I heard on this was, was for a swifter response, for a more stringent um, uh, approach when it comes to our by security. So I simply do not buy the arguments that have been, forward, been put forward uh, by the government to justify uh, w what they're doing here. A, a third justification offered by the minister is that any disallowance of regulations would have a significant impact. And this justification I, I find particularly problematic. Uh, Surely, where the consequences of laws are more significant, uh, more, not less, parliamentary oversight is needed. Uh, I will not be moving an amendment to this bill, but I urge all senators to work to protect the oversight we were elected to provide. The Senate is the House of Review, and we need to make sure that this function 
is always properly applied. There, as someone who's new to this place, it, it seems to me that there, there's a huge amount um, of legislation that is issued in, in the way of, of regulations, the ministers deciding on, on aspects of, um, of policy. That should then be subject to oversight in here. We should at least be able to have the discussion to be, talk, to be able to talk about it in this place, in committees, and then come to an informed decision after scrutiny. With this bill, the government is seeking to remove that oversight of the Senate, to remove that ability to ensure that the laws we make are in the best interests of, of the Australian people. As Senator Scar pointed out, there are parts of this uh, bill that confer extraordinary powers, and you could argue, uh, rightly so, that that is justified when it comes to matters of biosecurity. I'd say there's as, as, as strong an argument that with those uh, extraordinary powers should, there should be oversight from, from the Senate. And I would urge the government to uh, consider this and uh, going forward to not introduce bills uh, to this place uh, that have similar arrangements. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Brockman. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to speak on the biosecurity amendment, strengthening biosecurity bill. Obviously, this is something that's very close to my heart, coming from uh, regional Western Australia and being very concerned um, for the agricultural industry. And obviously, biosecurity, biosecurity arrangements and successful biosecurity arrangements are one of the pillars that will enable agriculture to meet its growth targets over the next decade. So, uh, obviously, we are uh, extraordinarily happy to support measures that do uh, increase those protections, particularly for our agricultural community, and to see a constant evolution. This is a constant battle. Uh, as population flows, as trade flows increase, and these are good things, we like the fact that people move. Uh, that we like the fact that people can travel. We like the fact that trade can occur between nations. This is a positive. This is a positive for our nation. This is a positive for other nations. It also does leave our uh, environment and our agricultural producers at risk of biosecurity threats. And obviously, we've seen that very starkly revealed over the last six months with uh, foot and mouth disease uh, and lumpy skin. Uh, being found in our near neighbour in Indonesia. And, uh, it is a constant battle to make sure that our systems and processes and the structures of our regulatory regime keep up with the uh, increased and, and constantly increasing pressure uh, on, uh, on those systems. So we do need to keep a watching brief on this. This isn't something you can set and forget, so we do welcome the government's uh, introduction of these measures. Uh, we particularly support the bill because uh, it allows for a new uh, measures to manage biosecurity risk coming from travellers. Now, I guess, as I said, this is very important because of the recent outbreak of foot and mouth disease in Indonesia uh, and the risk of, of that disease finding its way into Australia, which obviously uh, would be absolutely devastating for agricultural producers. Uh, it expands pre-arrival reporting requirements for aircraft and vessels, and obviously getting people to think about biosecurity is one of the key tasks. If people think about it, they will act appropriately. If they don't think about it, then there's always the risk that things will slip through. It allows for better information sharing with government agencies and other bodies. Uh, it raises civil and criminal penalties for breaches, uh, which obviously, again, uh, if people are aware that there are penalties involved, they will behave more carefully. Uh, it increases transparency around the process, increases efficiency and transparency of expenditure on biosecurity programs, and improves the operation 
of provisions relating to the approval arrangements and compensation. Now, as I said, these are common sense measures. They certainly have our support and uh, they certainly have the backing of the agricultural industry. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to say that this is not just a plant biosecurity bill. In addition, it is a human biosecurity bill. Many of the provisions on the plant biosecurity we endorse. While we support many of those plant biosecurity initiatives, we cannot support the provision that enables the government to consign a class of people to quarantine. After the COVID mismanagement, deceit and abuse that we saw from state, Liberal and Labor Party and National Party governments and a Liberal Party in government at federally, the last thing that One Nation wants to do is to give politicians and unelected bureaucrats more power. That's the last thing we will do. Government is always a trade-off between the rights of the individual and the need for collective action against real security threats. And I emphasise real security threats. This bill, when it comes to the human quarantines, will move the weight of power further into the hands of government and unelected bureaucrats and away from the people. In the eternal human challenge between control and freedom, we must always support and enable freedom. To give any government this much power presupposes the government knows what to do with it. So let's have a look at the recent history of governments in this country when it comes to a virus and supposedly quarantining. I've compiled a list of 30 initiatives that occurred for the first time in our country's history. I'll just read a few of them. I'm not going to read all 30. This is the first time that governments forcibly injected people with something that can kill them and is killing them. People are dying in their hundreds and potentially their thousands in this country because we have not got the records accurate. Government prevents, this is the first time that governments have prevented sick people accessing a proven, safe, effective treatment in ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. They banned it when other, other countries and good doctors in this country worked out it was very successful and very safe. It's been given in 3.7 billion doses, yet they were banned. And the doctors then were banned for doing their job. Greg Hunt, the then Minister for Health federally said the world, this is his word, these are his words, the world is engaged in the largest clinical vaccination trial. It was experimental, it was a radical new gene therapy based treatment and yet it was being mandated. It's not been tested, it's had a literature review, that's it. We've seen a massive transfer of wealth from taxpayers to big farmers. How the hell can we trust government in this country, state and federal? They said towards the end of the second year, we now need to live with the virus. Oh, really? And then they extended the emergency provisions, the, state, the declared states of emergency. We cannot trust governments in this country. Then look, look at the previous Prime Minister. He said repeatedly that Australia has no vaccine mandate. Scott Morrison's own words. Yet the Morrison-Joyce federal government drove the vaccine mandates that forcibly injected people and at the very least they enabled the mandates because it was the federal government, Joyce Morrison government, that bought 280 million doses of this stuff. They could have stopped the states at any minute simply by not giving the states the, the injections. Secondly, the federal government indemnified the states against vaccine damage. Thirdly, the federal health department provided the data and systems needed for states to enforce the mandates. The federal government drove this. The state premiers agreed because they say that their vaccine mandates are in line with the unconstitutional so-called national cabinet that the prime minister led, Scott Morrison led. The federal government mandated vaccines in aged care workers and defence department and the Australian Electoral Commission full of lies, not based on science. 
And that's just with the existing provisions without this one that's being added. Then we saw APRA, a concocted regime based upon so-called national law. Now we see Queensland driving the latest iteration of national law, making it a provision that the confidence in the health system is more important than patient care. That is naked suppression and control of doctors. Then we realise that the injections that were forced on people, if you want your kids to eat, then you'll get this injection. That's what was done in this country. We saw that untested injections were used, or partially tested, very inadequately tested, incompletely tested. And approvals were based in America for these injections on big farmers' word. That's it. The CDC didn't test them, the FDA didn't test them. Our TGA and Atagi swallowed the lie about these injections. Military boots were put on the ground to enforce imprisonment of healthy people in the homes in New South Wales. The Victorian Premier, Dan Andrews, ordered his militarised police to fire on innocent protesters. Who will ever forget what happened at the Shrine of Remembrance on Anzac Day? He locked down the Shrine of Remembrance on Anzac Day. Who will forget the digger who was stopped from entering the Shrine of Remembrance on Anzac Day? Arbitrary degrees changing from one day to the next. How the hell can the science behind all these measures be, be, be science when they're conflicting? Science should be transparent, not locked in a cupboard. And if it's science, it should be consistent and debatable. None of this applied in COVID restrictions. Instead, we had censorship and persecution of good and decent doctors accused of being heretics. This is, not, this is 2022 not 1692 in Salem, Massachusetts, when dissenters were labelled witches and burned. Today it's doctors and nurses being burned, their 40-year careers being burned at the stake. Now their careers are not even smouldering embers. They're gone. They're dead. Power must always be accompanied by transparency. And yet we cannot even get copies of big farmers vaccine contracts with our federal government. The Greens and the Labor Party stopped that. The vote was tied. The process of dismissing almost 1,000 doctor-supported deaths due to COVID injections turned into 15. So the process that was used by the TGA to take a thousand, almost a thousand doctors reported deaths, and doctors are responsible for reporting deaths in this country, and making it 15 is not even quantified, not even specified. It's arbitrary. And we also know from listening to doctors and nurses that the reported deaths are a tiny fraction of the actual deaths. So there's way more than a thousand. That's the story overseas as well. And now you want more power? More power to put classes of people into quarantine? Who would they be? Non-vaccinated people? And you want power over people? You're not going to get it from one nation. That's why we cannot support this. All the above things I talked about were for a coronavirus that the Chief Medical Officer admitted to me in writing was low to moderate severity low to moderate severity. Then look at the actual results. This is from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, published in part as a result of a One Nation document discovery a few weeks ago in this very chamber. In 2019, the year before COVID, the seasonal flu cost 4,126 lives. The next year, 2020, Australia recorded 882 deaths from COVID and 2,287 deaths from the flu for a total of 3,169 deaths. Almost a thousand deaths less than the flu alone killed the previous year. Then in 2021, 1,137 deaths were recorded from COVID and 2,073 recorded from the flu, for a total of 3,210. This means that deaths from the flu, including COVID, across the first two years of the virus in this country were right on the long-term average of 3,255. There was nothing unusual about the Australian death rate in 2020 or 2021. And yet the COVID substances, 
the injections were given emergency approval without any testing. The only thing unusual about our death rate in 2021 was that it was at a seven-year low. This makes a joke of provisional approval granted for injections out of, out of urgency. We are the party of freedom. Freedom is the key to human progress. Freedom is the key to responsibility. Freedom is the key to human satisfaction. Freedom is the key to truth, which was, which was squashed and suppressed and became a victim of the government's COVID restrictions at state and federal levels. Before you ask for additional power, we need a royal commission to establish whether you need more power, and if the power you already possess has been used properly and honestly. You're asking us for more power, yet you have not established why you need more power and you have already misused the power parliaments have given you and exercised your power with zero transparency at state and federal level. We cannot support this because it contains a provision for classifying humans into quarantine as a class. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation, and we will always stand for freedom. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Watt. Thank you, thank you Acting Deputy uh, President. Uh, can I thank all senators for their contributions for this debate, um, some of which I agree with more than others, um, but uh, I do very much welcome the contributions that we've, we've seen. Uh, the Biosecurity Amendment Strengthening Biosecurity Bill will amend the Biosecurity Act 2015 to strengthen Australia's ability to manage biosecurity risks such as foot and mouth disease posed by goods and by maritime and aviation traveller arrivals. In response to the current threats, we have deployed the strongest ever response to a biosecurity threat at our border. We have supported our Indo-Pacific neighbours, toughened our legislation, stress-tested our preparedness and aligned ourselves carefully with state and territory partners in the nation's first national biosecurity strategy. It's worth repeating that Australia remains both foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin, skin disease free. But the last few months have illustrated the need for a biosecurity system which is up to contemporary challenges. To that end, I'm pleased to say that the centrepiece of our agriculture budget this year was an investment of $134.1 million to bolster Australia's biosecurity system against the immediate threat of disease. Critical to implementing these measures are strong legislative powers that enable biosecurity officers to effectively manage the biosecurity risk. This will be done through new measures that manage biosecurity risk arising from travellers and classes of individuals for the purposes of preventing or reducing the risk of a disease or pest, such as foot and mouth disease, being introduced into Australia from the footwear and clothing of travellers. The bill will strengthen the legislative framework in responding to and managing human biosecurity risks. This will be done by expanding pre-arrival reporting requirements to ensure access to up-to-date information is available to inform the management of human biosecurity risks and strengthening penalties for non-compliance. The bill will enable more effective sharing of information with government agencies and other bodies in line with other Commonwealth legislation, while ensuring that protected information is afforded appropriate safeguards. The bill will increase pecuniary, penal pecuniary penalties that apply to specified criminal offences and civil penalty provisions in Chapters 3 and 4 of the Biosecurity Act, which deal with managing biosecurity risks relating to goods and conveyances. These increases apply primarily to regulated entities such as commercial importers and to operators and persons in charge of aircraft or vessels, all of whom have a particular responsibility to know and understand their obligations under the Biosecurity Act. The increased civil penalties will serve as a deterrent to anybody considering undermining our biosecurity laws, and the criminal penalties will allow appropriate and proportionate punishment for offences under the Biosecurity Act. The process for making certain determinations relating to the import of goods, including the granting of permits, based on risk assessments will be streamlined by this bill. Other amendments will ensure transparency and efficiency of expenditure on biosecurity-related programs and activities by permitting the Agriculture Minister and Health Minister to authorise the expenditure directly through the Biosecurity Act. This bill will enhance the effectiveness and efficiency of the management of approved arrangements 
while also improving processes for approved arrangement administration, auditing and the consideration of compensation claims. The bill will provide for a new civil penalty provision targeting individuals who attempt to conceal goods from a biosecurity official at the border. The new penalties will be subject to the infringement notice scheme under the Biosecurity Act and serve as a deterrent to carrying out this serious behaviour that could jeopardise Australia's biosecurity status. Uh, I know there's been a lot of public commentary uh, about the level of penalties that exist under current legislation in relation to biosecurity offences, and the government is taking action to lift those penalties uh, to ensure that we have strong deterrents against people doing the wrong thing and exposing our uh, food and livestock and grains and crops industries to biosecurity threats. Passage of this bill will ensure that the biosecurity framework remains effective and responsive in protecting Australia's animal and plant health, environment and economy. This includes ensuring the biosecurity framework remains fit for purpose when responding to emerging biosecurity and human biosecurity risks. Uh, now, Acting Deputy President, I do uh, foreshadow moving an amendment, but I don't know whether now is quite the right time for me to introduce that. No? no? Okay, I'll do that at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that this bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Roberts, we can re record your dissent. Thank you. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Biosecurity Act 2015 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Minister. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, now would probably be the right time to move the amendments listed in, I think, in my name. Um, that's uh, on sheet TK327. So I'm, I so move. Is leave granted? Leave oh. is granted. Sorry, I should have sought leave. Having, having, having got leave, I now move those amendments. In doing so, could I also table the supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to this amendment? Thank you, Thanks. Minister. Senator Wish oh, sorry, Senator Wish Wilson, Can just I briefly speak to that amendment. I'll call ready? you next, Senator Wish Wilson. Thanks. Minister. Um, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Australia's biosecurity system is facing increased risks due to individuals co deliberately concealing goods to evade detection at the Australian border. We've seen this recently, and I have to say, as the minister, I've been very surprised that the lengths that some people will go to to conceal goods that they know very well should not be being brought into this country and expose our agriculture industry to risk. Individuals attempting to conceal goods such as meat and meat products, seeds and plant material and fresh fruits and vegetables in their luggage, in their clothing or on their person, that is a serious flouting of Australia's strict biosecurity laws. These goods, uh, if undetected, could introduce serious pests and diseases into Australia, devastating our $70.3 billion agricultural export industries, the 1.6 million jobs across the agricultural supply chain and our way of life. Everyone should openly and honestly declare goods, such as food items, on arrival in Australia so that biosecurity officers can inspect the items and assess the biosecurity risk. The concealment of goods at the border prevents our biosecurity officers from being able to appropriately assess and manage the biosecurity risk associated with those goods. Under the current penalties scheme, individuals who attempt to conceal high-risk goods including within their luggage, are subject to the same penalties as individuals who conduct less serious behaviour. I don't think that's right. The, the new measures in these amendments, therefore, will provide for stiffer penalties where someone demonstrates the more serious behaviour of concealing high-risk goods to evade detection. 
This may include acts like sewing goods into the lining of a suitcase or placing goods within a container with incorrect markings or labels. This includes a new civil penalty provision that would apply a higher maximum civil penalty of 1,200 penalty units. An individual may also be liable to an infringement notice with an amount payable of $4,440, the highest amount we have ever seen for an infringement notice for an individual under the Biosecurity Act, and this is approaching double the current amount of the infringement notices. These stronger penalties will provide an effective deterrent against this serious behaviour that jeopardises Australia's biosecurity system while putting the focus on individuals who commit serious non-compliance by attempting to conceal high-risk goods when entering Australia. Thankfully, the vast majority of individuals, including those returning from overseas, do the right thing and declare their goods on arrival in Australia. These new measures are designed to target the very small minority who not only fail to declare their goods but who choose to conceal goods to evade detection. Biosecurity is everyone's responsibility and everybody needs to do the right thing. If they don't, the Australian public would rightfully expect an appropriate punishment. These new measures will provide a more proportionate response that better reflects the seriousness of these contraventions of our biosecurity laws. We will not tolerate behaviour that jeopardises Australia's agricultural industries, our food supply chain, our unique environment and our way of life. Thank you, Minister. Senator Wish Wilson. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, I wasn't planning to ask any questions in this um, committee stage, but I did listen to the Minister's second reading uh, uh, contribution and, and was disappointed he didn't acknowledge the concerns that were expressed in this chamber uh, over the last hour around the fact that we're voting to support an important bill today, but we're also voting to reduce the power of the Senate, uh, and we're voting uh, against our own uh, function and duties to scrutinise legislation. So, Minister, would you uh, take the opportunity now to address our concerns in relation to uh, both um, the scrutiny of Digest 6 of 2022 concerns around the uh, inclusion of no invalidity clauses uh, to propose sections 196A and 393B uh, and why you didn't amend the bill that made determinations under proposed Schedule 196A, 196B and 393B um, and make them disallowable and therefore subject to parliamentary oversight. Minister. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And just before addressing Senator Bush Wilson's question, I also table an addendum to the explanatory memorandum relating to this bill. This addendum actually responds to the concerns that were raised by the Scrutiny of Bills Committee. So, um, Senator Wilson, it certainly was my intention to address these issues because I know a number of senators raised them in their contributions, but I wanted to do it in the context of tabling that addendum. Um, this was something that was requested by the Scrutiny of Bills Committee, I believe, only yesterday, and they asked for that to be done in time for this debate to uh, for it to be considered as part of this debate. So I thank the departmental officials and uh, my own personal staff in my office for the speed with which they've addressed this issue. You're right, Senator Wish Wilson. Um, there has been a lot of back and forth uh, in the last couple of weeks, particularly between uh, myself, my department, and uh, the scrutiny committees of this parliament uh, about what are essentially non-disallowable powers that are being provided through this legislation to uh, the Agriculture Minister of the day. And as, as I've made clear to those committees, um, I haven't taken it lightly uh, to uh, put forward legislation which provides powers to a minister, which for the moment happens to be me, but will be someone different at some point in the future, which are non-disallowable uh, by the Senate. Um, obviously, the, the usual practice is that powers granted to ministers um, in whatever field are disallowable by the Senate to provide some sort of a check and balance on the potential misuse of those powers by ministers. Uh, I would point out um, that the existing Biosecurity Act uh, does contain a small number of powers related to biosecurity outbreaks. Um, that are granted to either the Agriculture Minister or the Health Minister of the day. So it has been the case in years gone by that this parliament has recognised that, particularly in the circumstance of a major biosecurity outbreak that threatens human or animal or plant health, uh, that there are limited circumstances in which the Minister of the day needs to be given powers to act very quickly to contain an outbreak 
without the threat of those, of those decisions and those powers being uh, jeopardised by potential overrule, if you like, by the Senate. Uh, and similarly, in the amendments that we're putting forward in this legislation, um, we are conferring additional powers uh, to uh, the Agriculture Minister of the day. Um, and it is in response to the recent threats that we've seen, particularly around foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease. And they are powers, for instance, to um, direct uh, how passengers arrive in airports and what they need to do on arrival, um, the ability to put down foot mats or other protections at airports, um, the sort of measures that we, we undertook in response to the recent threat, but I can tell you was a pretty convoluted process um, under the existing legislation to enable those things to have happen. And of course, that was all in, in a situation where, fortunately, we didn't um, have an outbreak here. It was about the threat of a potential outbreak. If we ever were in a situation in Australia where we did have an outbreak of a serious animal or plant disease, like foot and mouth disease, we need to be able to act quickly and we need to be able to act with certainty without the threat of those powers being overturned by the Senate. Now, as I say, I recognise that it is, un it is not the norm for these sort of powers to be non-disallowable. And that's why, with this legislation, we're, only, we're confining um, the non-disallowable nature of certain powers to a very small number of um, powers that would only be needed to be used in the most extreme circumstances. There's a number of other powers that are being provided in this legislation that, will, that would be disallowable by the Senate, because we recognise um, that, uh, in general, powers being used by ministers should be subject to oversight by the Senate. But, as I say, there's a very small number of powers being provided for in this legislation um, that uh, would th it is our view, and it's certainly the advice of my department, um, that w may be needed in the event of a serious biosecurity emergency. And uh, my, my number one responsibility in that situation as the Agriculture Minister is to be able to bring an outbreak under control quickly before it spreads, before it potentially wipes out an entire industry, and we need to be able to act fast and we need to be able to act with certainty. So, as I say, um, I understand that this is not you know, uh, the, the, you know, what we see in most occasions um, through legislation, that powers are granted on a non-disallowable non basis, uh, and that's why some of the other powers that are being provided by this legislation would be disallowable except for the very small number where it's our view and the department's advice to me is that they are necessary to, be, to, to allow a minister of the day to act very quickly to bring that sort of an outbreak under control. Senator Wish Wilson. Thanks, Minister. I think the, um, Senator Pocock's also got some questions. I'll, look, I'll be very quick. Um, what, what you said there, I think you, my feeling is you've got tripartite tripartisan support for giving you those special those, those special powers to, to act when you need it. Um, everyone wants to see strengthened biosecurity. The issue here is you're taking away our ability to scrutinise it. You didn't actually address the issue. The issue is once you once this passes today, it immediately goes into law. But the Senate has its required number of days to scrutinise this. Now you've you've just tabled the ad addendum to the explanatory memorandum containing the key information, uh, and it was requested by the Scrutiny Bills Committee to do that as, as soon as practical, um, and noting these, the importance of these explanatory materials as a point of accessing, uh, sorry, as a point of access to understanding the law and, if needed, as extrinsic material to assist the Senate with our interpretation. Well, we've just you've just tabled that now. I haven't had a chance to read it, nor has anyone else. Um, and you know what? I'd have 15 work. I'd have 15 Senate sitting days to do that. And if there was concerns, I could raise them with you or with other senators, and perhaps we could have that debate. That's all we're asking for—just a chance to be able to do our job. Um, we're not saying we're not going to support your your abilities and your special powers under this legislation to do your job. We just need to do our job and scrutinise this. And you've taken that away today. I accept it's a small number of things, but the point still stands that you are reducing the power of the Senate and parliamentary oversight with this legislation today. Minister. Oh, I presume you're going to say similar things, so maybe I should respond at the end. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And, uh, if I, could, uh, I think the minister is aware of my concerns. And if I could, at the outset, um, just thank the minister uh, for the way in which he engaged with the scrutiny process 
and secondly, if I can thank members of his department uh, who made themselves available for, uh, uh, in order to give briefings to the scrutiny committee. So that was, uh, I think, uh, greatly appreciated through you, uh, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. Minister, do you recognise that, for example, one of the scrutiny principles which the scrutiny pr uh, committees apply is whether or not an instrument is actually made um, in accordance with the provisions of an act? So if an instrument is issued which is outside the parameters of the Act, that in itself is something um, which can be picked up through the scrutiny principle, uh, application of the scrutiny principles by the scrutiny of delegated legislation committee. Um, and there's an important uh, aspect in terms of the uh, application of the scrutiny principles by this place. Secondly, there's also uh, scrutiny which applies with respect to whether or not an instrument is constitutional, uh, which again goes to the heart of the instrument uh, and whether or not it should remain in power. And lastly, uh, with respect to your particular point about the need for the department to move quickly and for you as minister to move quickly in order to discharge your duty, I think we recognise that. Um, and I compliment you on the seriousness with which you take your duties. I've, I've had no question about that and with the advice of the department. But the scrutiny process doesn't prevent the taking of urgent action, and in fact, in most cases where there are scrutiny principles raised or scrutiny issues raised, there's an iterative process with the department and with the minister to ad address those scrutiny principles through that iterative process. Um, and even if an instrument is disallowed, uh, it doesn't change the. Um, it doesn't go back in time to the point when the instrument was issued. It just looks forward in time, in the very unlikely event that the instrument is disallowed. So, I'd be um, interested in uh, uh, you considering those points. Thank you, Senator Scott. Sen uh, Minister. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I thought I might just respond to the issues that have been raised so far. Um, Senator Wish Wilson, uh, I think. Um, sounds unhappy with the fact that that addendum to the explanatory memorandum has only been tabled. Um, I would point out that my office received the letter from the committee only about lunchtime yesterday, and I can tell you have moved heaven and earth to get the addendum even done at all. So, sure, in an ideal world it would have been nice to be able to provide that to you earlier, and maybe it would have been nice to receive the committee's letter earlier, but I understand they had to work through their processes and we've had to do the same thing. So, um, you know, I just want to defend um, the people in my department and office who have worked very hard to provide that addendum at extremely short notice. Um, the, before I just respond to Senator Scar, Scar's points, again, I just want to point out that this is not the first time that we have seen um, non-disallowable powers provided to a minister, the Health or Agriculture Minister, through the Biosecurity Act. In fact, the current Biosecurity Act contains 28 provisions that enable the making of legislative instruments that are exempt from disallowance. And again, that's because biosecurity outbreaks are extremely serious things that need to be brought under control very quickly. And as I say, I recognise that um, there are probably many more powers within the biosecurity legislation than 28 that are disallowable, um, but this is not an unprecedented action, and of course it is recognised. Um, in the, legis the Commonwealth Legislation Act, that there is the ability for parliaments to confer non-disallowable ministers uh, powers uh, on ministers for extreme situations. Um, it's not as if there is no power to do so, but it is important that when ministers come to this chamber and seek those sorts of powers, that they be confined to extreme situations, which is the case here. Um, and what is also the case here is that the non-disallowable powers we're talking about that would only be able to be used in the event of an extreme biosecurity emergency also can only be used on the basis of scientific advice. It's not, um, there's not some wide power for ministers to go out and do whatever they want. They need to be able to justify and demonstrate that they've got scientific advice from our biosecurity experts in the department, for instance. Um, that, that the kind of actions we're talking about are necessary, um, and as, as I say, they're for a very limited number of functions. Senator Scar, I may not be able to call every single one of your questions, but the, the point that you made towards the end, um, and I've, I've, we've had this discussion obviously in the lead up to this legislation, that um, uh, 
that if these powers were to be disallowable rather than non-disallowable, they can still be exercised and if there is a problem with them, they can be then dealt with through disallowance. The, the, the risk, I guess, is not only are we talking about a situation where there's a biosecurity emergency, but a number of the powers that are provided to the minister require action from other people, such as airport operators, um, ports, and in some cases would require significant investments from them to be able to manage, to be able to do what the minister is directing them to do. And our experience is that it can take some time to negotiate these things with airport operators and ports and other people, uh, and particularly if you're talking about requiring people to make big investments to, to meet those powers, the risk that they are going to be overturned by the Senate we, we think is potentially a deterrent from the likes of airport operators, port operators and others to do what is necessary to be done. So I guess, again, we're talking about a situation where there's a biosecurity emergency. We need all action stations. We need everyone heading in the same direction very quickly, whether it be government, airport operators, port operators, biosecurity officers, whoever's involved, to contain an episode. And the risk of potential disallowance of these powers, we think, is a disincentive um, for some of the external parties that we need cooperating with us from getting on and doing what needs to be done. Senator Starr. I thank, I thank the minister for that um, fulsome response. And again, I, I in no way question the minister's integrity or sincerity in this respect, and I think he appreciates that. But, but minister, when you um, when you list enumerate those those factors about commitments being made, isn't every one of those factors something which could properly be considered by the senators in this place when they're considering a disallowance and in the application of the scrutiny principles? Minister. Um, well, yes, it is, but every day that we either don't act or face the risk of powers being overturned is a day that a biosecurity episode could get bigger and more damaging to the community, to industry and to the environment. So that, it's, it's all about the need for speed in a biosecurity emergency. Senator Scar, just wait for the call. Thank you, Thank you uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, and again, I, I appreciate the comment you're making, but from my perspective and I think my colleagues' perspective, uh, those are matters which could all be properly considered by, by the senators in this place. And I come back to two of the other questions I made, and I note I made a number of comments, Minister, so um, just to uh, return to those. One of the scrutiny principles which the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee considers is whether or not an instrument is made within lawfully made under the power of the Act. And, and that is a key scrutiny principle which uh, I think you would um, be familiar with, Minister, uh, and a key, key role of the Scrutiny Committee to actually consider whether an instrument itself is lawful. And whilst the instrument might, might be based upon advice of the Department, there have been numerous occasions, whilst I've been serving on the Scrutiny Committee, where instruments have been put forward where the Scrutiny Committee has gone back to the Department and, and the Minister and queried whether or not the instrument could be properly made uh, under the terms of the Act. And there's certainly one example in relation to the arena legislation where it was actually ultimately determined that um, no, it couldn't be. So that's a, that goes to the heart of whether or not an instrument is properly made within the ambit of the Act. And isn't that an important scrutiny principle uh, and an important matter for this Senate to consider in determining whether or not something should be subject to disallowance? Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Scar. Well, two things. I mean, I think the, the Senator has in some ways answered his own point by pointing to the arena example, which was ultimately found uh, to be outside um, the scope of the law. I don't know if it went as far as being found to be illegal, but it was found. So there are remedies there. And in particular, as you would know um, from your legal background, people do have the ability to, to challenge uh, what is effectively an unlawful action or unlawful decision by a government in a court. So in a, in a hypothetical situation where a minister used, these, uh, um, used powers that were not um, actually allowed to be provided by the primary religious legislation, that is a decision that can be challenged in court. Well, just just uh, just responding responding to those points, and and the minister might not be across, and I, I appreciate this if the minister is not across the particulars of the arena case, 
but the ARENA instrument was only considered because it was disallowable and therefore came before the scrutiny committee. So that issue wouldn't have been identified but for the fact that it was contained in a disallowable instrument and therefore fell within the ambit of the scrutiny principles. So I, I um, take the minister's point, but I think there is a legitimate point there to be considered. And the second point, with the, uh, the minister's um, previous career, and I know the minister feels very strongly about representing people um, who, um, who need, in his previous career, who need assistance with respect to legal representation and making sure that um, everyone in this, in this country has, a, has, a, has the ability to seek justice. Doesn't the, isn't it much easier? Isn't the reality that there are many people who are subject to instruments made in this place simply don't have the power, don't have the financial resources, don't have the ability to run off to court to challenge something? And in that situation, the scrutiny committees of this parliament perform an extremely important role to effectively act for those people who we're elected to represent. Minister. Um, I can't really add. I mean, most of that I think is commentary from Senator Scar, and I uh, respect. Um, his right to put his views forward. I can't really add much to what I've said. Let's remember that what we're talking about here is powers, for example, for a minister to be able to, without any interruption or any obstacle, be able to direct airports to put down foot mats in airports um, to, to keep our agriculture industry safe. I find it hard to imagine um, that anyone would want to take, would want to challenge that kind of a decision in court. Senator Pocock. Sorry, Senator Scott. Um, Thank you, thank you, Minister. And, and firstly, just to echo the, the words of other uh, senators, uh, thank you for the constructive way that you and your office and the department have engaged, uh, not just on this issue, on a, on a range of issues. Uh, being new to this place, I, I was very interested to learn that the scrutiny of bills committee, when it was established in 1981, was the first of its kind in the world. And since then, we've seen parliaments across Australia and the world adopt similar models. Uh, so I'm interested in terms of the process and the government's thinking on this. Given that the Scrutiny of Bills Committee has raised concerns and also the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation have, have raised concerns, and as I understand it, those concerns are, are unresolved, very valid concerns raised by committees that are chaired by government um, Senators, and from my experience, have a totally non-partisan way of, of, of dealing with this and, and um, undertaking the task of scrutinising bills and potential delegated legislation. What was the process for the government deciding to proceed with this legislation, despite having valid concerns from those two committees? Minister, um, thanks, Senator Pocock. The reason for proceeding. Um, and, and as I'm sure you're aware, there was extensive discussion between me and the committees, my office and the committees, my department and the committees. Like it has been quite a lengthy discussion process. But the, the reason for pushing on is that recent events have demonstrated that we need much stronger biosecurity powers as a country than what exists at the moment. And I don't want to, I don't want to waste a day in. Um, ensuring that I, as the Minister and the Department of Agriculture, have the powers that are necessary to deal with a foot and mouth disease outbreak, for example. Uh, and that's what this, this legislation is all about, is providing those powers. And I, I don't think you heard me earlier, Senator Pocock, say that the, um, the non-disallowable powers that are being provided by this bill are a very small number of powers confined to the most extreme circumstances. There are other powers in this bill that are disallowable, and that's the way it should be. I don't want to be providing any more non-disallowable powers than are necessary, and that's why we've confined the non-disallowable powers to the very small number uh, that this bill contains. Um, can I just also make the point? I'm, I'm obviously always happy to take questions about this um, this issue, um, but. Can we bear in mind that there's some other very important legislation we've got to get to today as well, such as the Respect at Work Bill? And I know there's a number of people who want to make contributions to that debate as well. No one else is seeking the call? Then I'll put the question. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. All those that have opinion say aye. Aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Uh, the question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. aye. Those against? 
Ayes have it. Uh, the question is now that the bill be reported. All those that, that opinion say aye. 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 Against? The ayes have it. The committee has considered the biosecurity amendment strengthening biosecurity bill 2022 and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. I move that the report be adopted. The question is that the report be adopted. All those that opinion say aye. aye. Against? The ayes have it. Minister. I move that this bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be moved uh, be agreed to. Uh, sorry. <laughs> the question is that the bill be read a third time. All those that opinion say aye. aye. Against? The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Biosecurity Act 2015 and for related purposes. Government Business Orders of the Day number 3, Anti-Discrimination and Human Rights Legislation Amendment Respect at Work Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Uh, just, uh, whip, um, yes. Between uh, those bills, I, on behalf of the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standards, um, uh, and I'm sure the clerk will need to jump again. I'm seeking for us yeah. not to move on just okay. yet so that I can so do you, this you'll little bit. So you'll need to seek leave. May I seek leave? I just need to move on behalf of par parliamentary committees to move that committees can meet and to move a leave of absence. It would be... Yep. Uh, is leave granted? Uh, Oh, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll just yeah. leave is granted. Thank you. On behalf of the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standards, I seek leave to move a motion to enable the committee to meet during the city sitting of the Senate today. Is leave granted? Is leave granted? I move that the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standards be authorised to hold private meetings otherwise than in accordance with Standing Order 33 brackets 1 during the sitting of the Senate today from 9 till 12.45 pm. Uh, I'll put the question. Uh, all those that opinions say aye. aye. Against? The ayes have it. Aye. Sorry. Uh, quorum required. Cancelled. Uh, we can't. We have a quorum. Thank you. The quorum present. Uh, uh, just, just. Okay, just to assist the chamber, I'll put the question again. Uh, the, the question is that the committee authorisation be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? The ayes have it. Uh, I to move a motion relating to leave of absence for Senator O'Neill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the leave of absence be granted to Senator O'Neill for today on account of parliamentary business. The question is that the uh, motion be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. aye. Those against? Aye. The ayes have it. And I'll call the clerk. Thank you. Government business order of day number three, anti-discrimination and human rights legislation amendment respect at work bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And I rise to speak on the anti-discrimination and human rights legislation amendment respect at work bill 2022. Uh, the bill before the chamber will implement further recommendations from the Respect at Work report. Uh, without a doubt, all sides of politics agree sexual harassment in the workplace is unacceptable. No matter who is in government, it is important that we all continue to work together to ensure that we combat sexual harassment in all Australian workplaces. 
The former coalition government commissioned the inquiry into sexual harassment in the workplace in June 2018. The final respected work report is a very detailed document which made 55 recommendations to the former coalition government. By the time the election was called earlier this year, the former government had implemented or fully funded 42 out of the 55 recommendations of the Respect at Work report and was working on the implementation of the remaining recommendations. The recommendations in the report were directed not just to the Commonwealth Government, but a number were also directed to the various state governments, uh, but also to the private sector. In response to the report, when we were in government, I worked with the Cabinet and released the roadmap for respect, which responded to the report, but it also outlined a long-term plan for preventing and addressing sexual harassment in the workplace. The roadmap included agreeing to, in full, in principle or in part, or noting all 55 recommendations of the Respect at Work report, and in particular it focused on prevention. The former coalition government provided over $64 million over the four years in real money to support the implementation of the roadmap uh, for Respect. In September of last year, our government legislated many of the recommendations of the Respect at Work report. This bill did many things. The Sex Discrimination and Fair Work Respect at Work Amendment Act 2021 expressly prohibited sex-based harassment. It made it clearer than it has ever been in Australian law that sex-based harassment is unacceptable. We also corrected gaps in the legislation to make sure that all workers are respected. We made it clear in the Sex Discrimination Act that members of parliament, judges and public servants would all be subject to the Sex Discrimination Act. This means that people are protected from sexual harassment regardless of the field in which they work or for whom they work. The former coalition government also established the Respect at Work Council, which brings together leaders from key government regulators and policymakers responsible for sexual harassment policies and complaints to improve coordination, consistency and clarity and this is just so important across existing legal and regulatory frameworks. We also increased the length of time that people have to make a complaint. Uh, the original time frame was six months, but based on the recommendations from the report and certainly listening to the stakeholder feedback, we lengthened that from the six months to 24 months after the incident. We also made incredibly important changes to the Fair Work Act uh, to make it clear that being a perpetrator of sexual harass harassment is a valid reason for dismissal. This is and continues to be an essential reform because what it actually did was make it possible for employers to dismiss a worker who sexually harassed another worker without the risk of them bringing an unfair dismissal claim in response. Again, based on the feedback, looking at the respect at work, it was essential that employers were given this ability, an ability they they just didn't have to respond swiftly when their employee's behaviour is unacceptable. As a community, it is, it is essential that we draw the line in terms of unacceptable behaviour in workplaces and beyond that has been common for too long. The bill that we have before us today in the Senate chamber is one that now builds on and continues the work that the former coalition government had commenced. It picks up on the particular issues that were given further time to ensure there was that in-depth consideration and consultation. And I'm pleased to say that with the work having progressed, we support the principles behind this bill. There is so much in this bill that we support. 
I welcome the 12-month period between ascent and commencement. This will be a central time for businesses, because it is businesses that need to go out there and learn about these new obligations. We are placing new obligations on businesses. We need them to be able to put in place the new protocols and policies to ensure that they get their response right and, at the same time, give them that ability to undertake the required training for their staff. The role of the Australian Human Rights Commission is also essential. Under this bill, the Australian Human Rights Commission will be responsible for developing guidance materials. And what we need to ensure is this guidance material it is clear, it is simple, and it is easy for businesses to understand. Again, it is the businesses that we are placing these additional obligations on. We need to ensure that the businesses are able to get that guidance in relation to what these new obligations are and how they need to properly discharge them. And on that basis, uh, the Human Rights Commission will be developing these guidance materials. It's important that these obligations apply to all workplaces, but when you actually look at the explanatory memorandum, and this is noted, a large bank or other large corporation with a human resources department will clearly have more resources at its disposal to ensure it is compliant. Um, but you need to then compare this particularly with small businesses, for example, a corner store uh, that only has a few staff. So in terms of the development of the guidance materials, the Human Rights Commission does need to ensure that the guidance materials, they can't be one size fits all because businesses are not one size fits all. They must need the needs, they must meet the needs of the different types of the businesses too. So reflecting the different capacities that businesses will have uh, to understand and discharge their obligations. The risks that businesses must manage under this Act and under the work health and safety framework vary significantly across industries. And again, this needs to be properly taken into account. When you look at the submission made uh, by the Housing Industry Association uh, in relation to this bill, um, they note it's extremely difficult for a business to control the various actors on a work site, the various trades, the subcontractors, the clients, the state-based regulators, the union officials, the owners sometimes and others. And similarly, when you look at a business, for example, a pub, a person creating an unsafe work environment for a second person may be an intoxicated patron rather than an employee of the business. So again, in terms of that fundamental role for the Australian Human Rights Commission in developing uh, this explanatory material, um, I would really want to see that the guidelines will need to address in full that range of different businesses and the circumstances in which they may find themselves. Guidance from the Human Rights Commission must meet the needs of businesses, as I said, because it's the businesses upon which we are placing these obligations. It needs to ensure that it is based on the different types of workplaces that exist across Australia. Um, every single day. You go into a different business, it is a different workplace. Um, and we need to ensure that that guidance material does address um, the different types of businesses that are the subject of this bill. Again, though, let me be very clear. There is no place for sexual harassment in Australian society or Australian workplaces. And that's why, when we were in government, the former coalition government took decisive action on these issues. Uh, the bill that we have before us today builds on the leadership of the former coalition government and the work that we did and the legislation that we put in place. Uh, without a doubt, we must continue to work as a society to continually improve and to ensure that everybody has an equal opportunity to succeed and that our workplaces are set up in such a way that someone who works hard, regardless of their background, can reach the highest of heights because we should not and never tolerate sexual harassment in the workplace or anywhere else. And I commend the bill. Senator Waters. 
Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Anti-Discrimination and Human Rights Legislation Respect at Work Bill of 2022. The Respect at Work report shone a light on the scale of workplace sexual harassment, something that we've become all too familiar with in this place. In her landmark report, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins set out a comprehensive, practical and a targeted suite of reforms to tackle the problem. Those 55 recommendations were the product of many interviews and consultations with victim survivors, business owners, government, unions, NGOs, lawyers and others, and they represented a holistic plan to address discrimination and structural inequalities, to relieve the burden on victims and to make workplaces safe. The recommendations were designed to be uh, implemented as an integrated package, but the previous government opted to cherry-pick the recommendations that it supported. They legislated some of them but left out the key one, the positive duty on employers to provide a safe workplace. And the uh, then government voted against a joint Greens Labor amendment to implement that positive duty. So we're really pleased. We called it out at the time, but we're really pleased that the uh, new government is now finishing the job and implementing the recommendations in full. The Greens welcome and support this bill. It is a positive and overdue reform to make workplaces safe and respectful for everyone. We have a number of uh, amendments to improve its operation. But the significance of the changes that this bill will make cannot be overstated. The Respect at Work report was clear that current laws present all kinds of barriers to workers calling out harassment—cultural attitudes, costs, risks, and the genuine fear that they'd be targeted at work through further harassment or loss of hours. This bill goes a long way towards remo removing those barriers. Firstly, the positive duty. This was the centrepiece of the Respect at Work report, but it was something that the previous government and some members of the business community resisted. They claimed it was unnecessary because workplace health uh, and safety laws already included duties to ensure workplace safety. Well, <laughs> those were clearly not working. If they were, we wouldn't have been seeing and still seeing more than a third of workers experience sexual harassment. It's just horrific numbers. Eliminating workplace sexual harassment will take a big cultural shift, and a positive duty to create and maintain a safe workplace is the best way to drive that cultural shift. It shifts the focus from individual employees having to report bad behaviour to individual employers um, to have to work out what to do about it. It requires employers to pr uh, proactively prevent discrimination and harassment in their workplace. Without such a positive duty, we're stuck with the current reactive, adversarial, victim complaint approach that's failed so many people—mostly women, people of colour, people with disability or queer folk. Now, it won't be a one-size-fits-all response. The steps taken by each workplace will depend on their size and their nature. But every workplace, once this bill passes, will have a responsibility to do what is needed to keep staff and clients safe. We'll move an amendment proposing that employers be required to consult with their staff about the specific measures needed in their workplace to achieve that. The Human Rights Commission, a body with clear expertise on protecting human rights and avoiding workplace discrimination, will, pre will prepare guidance for employers and will have powers to investigate and take action where needed. Employers will be given an opportunity to set out a plan for what they'll do, but the Commission can take compliance action if the business fails to make progress. We would like the compliance notices to be published to hold workplaces to account um, and to provide guidance to other workplaces. And I'll be moving an amendment along those lines as well. <clears throat> the goal is supporting employers to be better employers who listen to their staff and respond, but with a compliance framework that allows strong action to be taken when employers don't lift their game. I want to speak now um, on the hostile work environment. Uh, akin to the positive duty provisions, the bill takes workplace level uh, approach to cultural change, which is good. Sexual harassment is more likely to occur where a workplace environment is sexually charged or hostile, even if the conduct is not directed at a particular person. There's many examples, mine sites, where women are habitually given menial tasks and where predatory behaviour is ignored. Hospitality businesses, where women are expected to wear skimpy clothing and put up with lecherous customers. Lunchrooms, where sexist, racist or homophobic jokes are told or laughed at by senior staff or where anti-trans posters are displayed. The 2018 National Survey of Sexual Harassment found significantly higher rates of harassment in the fast food and retail industries, particularly for young women. 
So this bill introduces an offence of creating and maintaining a hostile work environment. It creates a clear obligation on employers and staff to identify cultures, work practices, uniforms and office setups that could create an environment in which harassment is facilitated, condoned or ignored. We strongly support this change. Um, however, we'll be pro pro proposing an amendment to ensure that the provisions operate as they are, intending, uh, as they are intended to. Uh, the bill makes two significant changes to address systemic harassment and relieve the burden on individual workers to pursue complaints. It gives the Human Rights Commission powers to have a look at systemic problems and practices, and it allows representative bodies to take action on behalf of workers. Now, examining systemic behaviour across a sector or workplace helps to identify the root causes of discrimination affecting many employees, rather than requiring one person to stand up to their boss and run the gauntlet of the legal system and risk their reputation, their mental health, their job, their finances. Many workers want the harassment to, the, to stop, but they don't want to be named as the victim. They want their workplace to be safe for them and others, but they don't want to have to go through a court process and the emotional and financial toll that it takes. Representative applications provide a way for genuine cases to be heard and employees to get justice without that personal toll. The bill also introduces a welcome protection against victimisation of workers who make complaints, another step towards making workers feel confident to come forward. These are good changes and we support them. In fact, we think that they should be replicated across all discrimination laws. And I'll be moving a second reading amendment, uh, which um, I'll move in due course, urging the government to progress that. The positive duty to provide a safe, work, safe workplace should apply to all protected attributes so that employers have to take proactive action to prevent discrimination on the basis of age, race and disability, as well as gender. Um, now I want to talk about costs. One of the significant barriers to workers taking action, and it's often the most significant one, taking action against colleagues or bosses, is the financial risk involved. The Women's Legal Centre says, and I quote, many women worry that they will not be believed and will be forced to pay the other side's legal fees. In the case of large businesses and government departments, these fees can be so significant that the average person would face financial ruin. It's no surprise that many women decide not to take this gamble. Now, the decision to make a complaint against someone in your workplace will always be difficult. Costs should not be the determining factor in, work, in whether workers are prepared to call out bad behaviour and insist on a safe workplace. The cost model that was proposed in this bill was intended to address this issue. However, more than 100 experts, victim survivors, lawyers, unions, advocates have raised concerns that the alleged fix would still act as a deterrent and for some would make it worse. Many women would still fear that taking a complaint could be both traumatic and financially risky. Without the ability to be awarded costs if the complainant is successful, women would also not be able to attract the services of no win, no fee lawyers, and we know that justice is not cheap in this country, more's the pity. That deterrence could be the difference between a harassing boss being held to account or allowed to continue to harass other employees. Now, those 100 experts had a better solution, an equal access cost model that would protect complainants against the risks of costs if they lose, but allow them to recover costs where the court finds that their employer or colleague had broken the law. Now, we strongly support that model. We were going to move an amendment to give effect to that model, um, but we've heard the government's concerns that having that model just for sexual harassment complaints would put them on a different footing to other discrimination complaints. Now, we would like to see the equal access cost model apply across the board, uh, but we recognise that it's important to get this right, so we're very pleased that the government agreed uh, with the Greens to pause those cost changes, and they won't be moving them, and that will come to those when the government moves their own amendments, and instead they'll now conduct a full review of cost provisions in consultation with all of those uh, who raised concerns. We will continue to push to make sure that workers can access justice uh, and that can, they can actually enforce these new rights that have been given to them. And we're hopeful and confident that the review will ultimately end up uh, with a more effective and equitable cost model that allows workers to get justice. Uh, now the bill also extends reporting obligations under the Workplace Gender Equality Act to the Commonwealth public sector. This is a very welcome move. Measuring data and monitoring progress is the key to closing the gender pay gap 
that sadly still persists across all industries. The Greens have long called for gender pay gap reporting to apply to the public sector, and we will continue to push for robust and transparent reporting across more workplaces and across more measures, including better data on the prevalence and resolution of sexual harassment complaints and the use of non-disclosure agreements to silence victim survivors. I'll talk briefly now about the review of the bill. This bill is a very significant and welcome change to the way that we'll approach harassment and discrimination in workplaces across Australia. It's a real opportunity to drive cultural change, and we need to know if it works. Given the scale and the importance of the changes, um, and given the diversity of workplace environments and employee experiences, it's important that we review how these changes are working in practice and whether they're achieving the aims of the Respect at Work report. We need to monitor how effectively the provisions of the bill are driving the cultural change that's needed to reduce the shocking levels of harassment in workplaces across the country and assess what additional reforms or support might be needed. So, uh, Myself, along with Senator uh, Tyrrell and Senator Lambie, will be moving an amendment to require such a review. I'm pleased that the government has indicated support for that amendment. Um, I'd finally like to talk about funding. As I've said, this bill is a critical opportunity to drive cultural change, but that opportunity would be undermined without adequate funding to the Australian Human Rights Commission, who will uh, undertake the extra powers and the duties under this bill. I was pleased to see the budget dedicate additional resources to the Human Rights Commission, but this must be kept under regular review to make sure that it's enough for the Commission to do its job. The proposed statutory review will look at that issue but I urge the government to heed any calls from the Commission regarding the money it needs. Uh, this bill could also be undermined if workers and employ employers can't access the support and the, the advice about their rights and responsibilities under the bill. We need a well-funded, functioning network of working women's centres to provide practical advice and support to employees experiencing harassment. Independent, expert, Community-based trauma-informed services are essential to the successful implementation of this bill. The Greens are really proud to support this bill, and we think our amendments would make a good bill even better. Workers across Australia, particularly women, deserve to be safe, respected and listened to. And I want to conclude my remarks by commending the work of the Sex Discrimi uh, Discrimination Commissioner, Kate Jenkins, who drafted this uh, very prescient report, which is now finally being legislated in full, and who's also done incredible work looking at uh, parliamentary workplaces. Um, she's finishing up her term soon, and I wanted to place on record a tribute to the quality of her work, which has had multi-partisan support and which indeed will make many women more safe in workplaces across the country. Thank you, Commissioner Jenkins. Uh, Senator Waters, um, would you like to move your amendment? I'd like to thank you very much, Chair. I would like to move my amendment, which is a uh, second reading amendment number one seven uh, on sheet number one seven one three circulated in my name. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Marielle Smith. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Once again, I find myself following Senator Waters on a topic in which I think we find uh, much overlap in our, in our views and beliefs. I want to thank you for your contribution and the contribution of others today. I'm also rising to speak to the Anti-Discrimination and Human Rights Legislation Amendment Respect at Work Bill 2022. This bill is a landmark moment having it brought to us today. It marks a significant step in fulfilling our election commitment to implement the recommendations of the Respect at Work report. And I am deeply proud to be part of a government which is taking these issues seriously, which is backing up the report recommendations with a bill before us today. And I'm delighted to have an opportunity to contribute to the debate. The bill before us will place a positive duty on employers to take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate sex discrimination, sexual harassment and victimisation as far as possible. It will expressly prohibit conduct that results in a hostile workplace environment on the basis of gender. It will ensure Commonwealth public sector organisations are also required to report to the Workplace Gender Equality Agency on its gender equality indicators. I note the government has amended the bill in the other place to make it clear that duty holders are required to take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate as far as possible third parties such as customers from subjecting their employees to sexual and sex-based harassment. And it will also provide the Australian Human Rights Commission with new powers to enforce a positive duty to help make sure employers are fulfilling their obligations. 
This means that in industries like retail and hospitality, where workers are already at risk of harassment by customers due to the front-facing nature of their roles, employers under this legislation will be required to take measures to protect their staff. I want to acknowledge the work of Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins and the Commission in producing this landmark report and the work done since to implement the report's recommendations, including through the Respect at Work Council. As the Attorney-General acknowledged in his speech to the House, this bill would not have happened without the individuals and organisations who contributed their stories, their advocacy and their expertise to inform the findings and the recommendations in the Respect at Work report. They should be proud of the bill which is before us today too. Acting Deputy President, every Australian has a right to feel safe and respected at work, no matter their gender, age, race or religion. The National Inquiry into Sexual Harassment in Australian Workplaces found that one in three people experienced sexual harassment at work in the preceding five years, with women experiencing higher rates of harassment than men. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, members of the LGBTQI community and people with a disability are on average more likely to experience workplace sexual harassment. Workers, no matter where they work, deserve to go to work each day without fear of being harassed and the perpetrators of harassment must be held to account. This bill provides a framework for holding our workplaces and communities accountable for failures to tackle harassment which occur under their watch, well overdue. This framework is especially important in industries where workers are at higher risk of harassment and abuse, like retail and hospitality. A survey conducted by the Human Rights Commission and the Retail Workers' Union, the SDA, in 2019 showed that 42 per cent of all survey respondents had experienced sexual harassment in the previous five years. For women, it was even higher, with 46 per cent of the women who participated in the survey reporting sexual harassment. And for young women, higher again, with 51 per cent of members aged 15 to 17 years having experienced sexual harassment at work. The harassment came from customers, from managers, peers and business owners. They're shocking statistics that speak to a workplace culture that has to change. And I remember being one of those statistics myself as a young retail and then hospitality worker. You never forget it. You never forget the feelings which start with embarrassment and awkwardness, which grow into a sense of discomfort and then fear about heading back into your workplace. The decisions you have to make about whether to seek another job, whether there is another job available. That anxiety which keeps you up at night because you don't want to go back into work tomorrow because you know the harassment you're going to experience and endure. No one should have to endure it. Acting Deputy President, this bill represents a paradigm shift in how public policy and the legislative framework will support those in our community experiencing sexual harassment and discrimination at work. It says loudly and clearly to all workers that they deserve to be safe at work. Change is hard. But it is essential because sexual harassment, just like violence, is not inevitable. It can be prevented. In this bill, we're taking steps to deliver change, and I commend it to the Senate. Uh, thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, and at, at the outset, can I just commend Senator Smith for uh, sharing uh, uh, her, her personal uh, experiences? in relation to this difficult uh, topic. Um, I think that shows great heart and uh, should be commended. Uh, the senator should be commended for it. Uh, before I make some comments in relation to the bill, uh, I just want to uh, reinforce two points which Senator Waters made. Uh, the first in relation to the issue of costs. This is a very, very complicated area and I do congratulate the government that they're reflecting further on the matter, uh, because it could well be as well intentioned that the costs provisions as originally proposed in this bill were, they could have led to a worse situation insofar as there was uncertainty for uh, legal professionals who might extend their services on a no win, no fee basis, uh, being concerned that there was a lack of certainty as to whether or not costs would flow the event from the event. So, I think these are really, really important matters which need to be carefully reflected upon. Uh, and in, in that connection, I think the other point that needs to be reflected upon is that this bill covers all workplaces, so it covers all businesses, all employers, both multinationals, from the multinational with huge human resource 
departments and in-house legal staff all the way to the sole trader. Uh, and that's another issue that needs to be reflected upon in relation to the issue of costs. Uh, the second point Senator Waters made, which I would like to uh, commend, was in relation to the resourcing of the Australian Human Rights Commission. Now, this is a big task. This is a big task that this parliament is putting on the Australian Human Rights Commission to take on the enforcement and compliance role with respect to uh, the, whether or not employers all over the country are discharging their role with respect to the positive duty. Uh, and I know from my experience working on the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee and putting questions to Ms Jenkins and also the President of the Australian Human Rights Commission, uh, the Human Rights Commission has an appreciation of the magnitude of that task, but they will need to have appropriate resourcing in order to discharge those, uh, those important obligations. Uh, I do serve on the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, and I did make some additional comments in relation to the bill. And I'd just like to touch upon three of those points uh, in relation to these comments. Um, I fully 100 per cent support the imposition of the positive duty on employers. There's absolutely no question about that. And I agree with Ms Jenkins uh, when she explained that it will be a powerful, and I quote, it will be a powerful tool in promoting broad systemic and cultural change around sex discrimination and sexual and sex-based harassment in the workplace. End quote. I did raise concerns with respect to the technical wording of the positive duty, and the main reason for that is there's a disconnect uh, between two parts of the clause. In one part of the clause, there's an imposition of a duty upon employers to take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate, and that is a, a fair articulation. There's a uh, there's some. Uh, uh, there's some consideration there given to whether or not you're dealing with a small business or a large business and the capacity of the business to put in place measures. So I think that phrase, reasonable and proportionate, is appropriate. But then the clause says to eliminate as far as possible sex discrimination, sexual harassment, victimisation and other relevant unlawful behaviour. And that begs the question, uh, on one hand we're saying reasonable and proportionate measures, on the other hand eliminating as far as possible. And there is somewhat of a disconnect between those two. Uh, notions, and I note it appears from the explanatory statement that is not the intention of the bill. That is not the intention. The intention appears to be um, to replicate what the principles are in terms of vicarious liability, and I note uh, and under, under Section 17 of the Work Health and Safety Act, uh, and indeed under uh, amendments proposed to the Fair Work Amendment Bill, where reasonableness of steps taken is the benchmark. So I really do query why we've introduced this, uh, this, word as far, this phrase as far as possible. There does appear to be a disconnect um, in relation to the drafting, and it would be good if that could be resolved. second point I wanted to make um, was just to reaffirm the, importance, yeah. reaffirm the importance of the Australian Human Rights Commission providing guidance, providing guidance to all the different employers uh, who are going to have to discharge this positive duty. In many cases, there are very complicated workplaces. This duty extends to protecting their staff from uh, acts of sexual harassment perpetrated by customers, clients, uh, all those people who their staff engage with. So one can well imagine that the challenges faced by, for example, someone who's managing a, a hotel, a pub, a nightclub, are going to be somewhat different from someone who's, who's, who's managing a, say, a news agency. And I think uh, the Home uh, Housing Institute of Australia raised particular concerns with respect to construction sites where you've got different employers, subcontractors coming onto a site, all sorts of people who are employees of all sorts of uh, organisations uh, coming together on a workplace. And it's very, very important, I think, that the Australian Human Rights Commission articulates quite, some quite clear guidelines, bespoke guidelines, for employers in different situations so that employers know clearly what they need to do in order to discharge their obligations. Again, um, from the questions I asked of the Australian Human Rights Commission, I, they are cognisant of the need to do that, um, and I look forward to how they, uh, how they discharge that obligation. The last point I'd like to make is I did make an additional comment that I could personally see some merit in terms of the Fair Work Ombudsman having the role in relation to enforcement. And the main reason uh, I could see the, the benefit of that was 
the Fair Work Ombudsman currently has nearly 1,000 employees all over Australia. So they can get access to work sites very easily. They're on work sites for other purposes. So whilst they're on a work site for purpose A, they could potentially be looking at whether or not an employer is discharging their positive duty with respect to protecting its staff, taking reasonable steps to protect its staff from, uh, from sexual harassment. Uh, so I, I could actually see some merit in terms of the Fair Work Ombudsman actually discharging that enforcement role, given the footprint they have at the moment across Australia in terms of infrastructure and in terms of staff. But um, I'll, uh, um, I do have confidence that the Australian Human Rights Commission understands uh, that uh, they need to mobilise additional resources in order to discharge their role on enforcement. And with that, um, I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Fariki. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Anti-Discrimination and Human Rights Legislation Amendment Respect at Work Bill uh, 2022, and I'd like to associate myself with the comments made by my wonderful colleague, Senator Waters. Uh, the bill implements those recommendations of the Respect at Work report, which the previous government chose to ignore, including the introduction of a positive duty on employers to take reasonable and proportionate steps to eliminate sex discrimination in their workplaces and the prohibition of conduct that uh, subjects another person to a workplace environment that is hostile on the ground of sex. The bill also provides the Australian Human Rights Commission with a function to inquire into systemic unlawful discrimination. Imposing a positive duty on employers to prevent sexual harassment, sex discrimination and victimisation with accompanying enforcement powers is so important. The Respect at Work inquiry found the current system places a heavy burden on individuals to make a formal complaint. The positive duty on the employer to create and maintain a safe workplace would be a step towards achieving a cultural shift and signalling to workers that their employers are invested in actually creating a safer workplace for all of them. As the Human Rights Commission has said, the positive duty would be a powerful tool to promote broad systemic and cultural change that sits outside of the current adversarial framework of discrimination law. So it is really good to see this introduction of positive duty on employers through this bill. However, the bill should do more, as described by my colleague Senator Waters, and as noted in the Greens' additional comments to the Senate inquiry into this bill, a core finding of the Respect at Work report and other work of the Australian Human Rights Commission was that sexual harassment and discrimination are often intersectional with compounding effect. Though specifically targeted at sexual harassment and sex-based discrimination, the bill really does present such a good opportunity to require employers to ensure their workplace is free from discrimination on any grounds which should have been, and it should, that opportunity should have been taken up by the government. There is no reason the positive duty and hostile work environment provisions should only apply to preventing discrimination on the basis of sex. And I know that Senator Waters will be moving a Greens amendment for similar obligations to extend to protect other attri um, protected attributes, such as race, age, and disability. The Greens are supporting the bill, of course, because it represents significant progress for women around the country who have so courageously spoken their truth about the harassment, bullying and abuse that they have been subjected to and have made it clear in no uncertain terms that they will not rest until this stops. This bill is the product of significant effort, investigation and ana analysis into sexual harassment and other forms of gendered violence at work. The national inquiry into sexual harassment in Australian workplaces was announced by the previous government in June 2018 in the context of the Me Too movement and global recognition of the serious harm caused by the problem of sexual harassment in workplaces. The inquiry, conducted over 18 months by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Kate Jenkins, was a world first. The 930-page report is comprehensive, thorough, well-researched and informed by extensive consultations with a wide range of stakeholders. It made 55 practical and carefully considered recommendations for reform to fix our broken system, all of which the Greens support. As a proud feminist, I celebrate the work we have done in this country to address sexual harassment 
and other forms of gendered violence at work. We must continue this work, but we should also be equally determined to eliminate other forms of systemic and structural discrimination in Australian workplaces, in particular racism, homophobia, transphobia and ableism. The Respect at Work report noted that alongside gender inequality, other inequalities experienced by groups with less power in society also contribute to the sexual harassment of people from these groups, and that addressing sexual harassment requires an intersectional approach. An intersectional approach to sexual harassment sees gender as intersecting with other forms of discrimination and systems of power. The report found that workers were more likely to experience sexual harassment in the workplace if they were LGBTQI+, First Nations, people from culturally and linguistically diverse communities, and migrant workers. As those in the chamber would know, the need to address racism is particularly close to my heart. It is a personal lived experience of mine and so many people in the community that I know. Racism compounds the sexism that women of color and First Nations women experience at work and obviously in society at large. And unfortunately in Australia, a nation built on genocide and racist government policies such as the white Australia policy, there is a deep reluctance to talk about racism and a persistent denial of the scale of the problem. But racism is pervasive in Australian workplaces. In response to the global push for racial justice in 2020, Diversity Council Australia prepared a report titled Racism at Work. The report surveyed 1,547 workers across various sectors and found 88% of respondents agreed racism is an issue in Australian organisations. And 93% of respondents agreed organisations need to take action to address it. Only 27% of survey respondents said that their organisations were proactively preventing workplace racism. Research respondents told of being singled out by their colleagues because of their race and being subjected to derogatory names, harmful stereotypes and constant taunting. They also told of having complaints downplayed or dismissed by management. Racism in Australian workplaces also manifests in many other ways, such as businesses disproportionately filling fixed term contracts with people of colour or failing to promote deserving people of colour. And this racism in workplaces does cause, cause immense personal harm, just as sexism and other forms of discrimination do. And for many of us, this intersection of racism and sexism really heavily compounds disadvantage, harm and discrimination. So the government really does need to start acting on preventing such harm from intersecting forms of discrimination in all our workplaces and in our society. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Tyrrell. I rise to speak on behalf of the Jackie Lambie Network. We have circulated an amendment on sheet 1700, but for the benefit of this chamber, we would like to advise we are no longer intending to move it. There's another amendment that we are intending to move on sheet 1702, but I'll talk about that later. First, I want to talk about the bill. Senator Lambie and I welcome the introduction of the government's bill, which implements the Australian Human Rights Commission's Respect at Work report. This legislation is long overdue. The Respect at Work report was published over two years ago. And for two years, we've known that women experience higher rates of workplace sexual harassment, more than men. For two years, we've known that certain groups of workers experience sexual harassment at a higher rate than others. Workers under 30 are copping it hard. Workers with a disability are copping it hard. And nobody should be copying it at all. For two years, we've also known that sexual harassment takes place in certain workplace settings, like workplaces where there's a high level of contact with third parties and workplaces with strong hierarchies. These facts are disturbing. What's also disturbing are the statistics that's behind this. The Respect at Work report looked at the data from the 2018 fourth survey on sexual harassment in Australian workplaces. That's, the survey results revealed that 33 per cent of people who had been in the workforce in the previous five years 
experienced workplace sexual harassment. That's one in three. And of the one in three, 80 per cent never reported it. The survey also revealed that 23 per cent of Australian women and 16 per cent of Australian men had experienced workplace sexual harassment in the previous year. Clearly, there's a massive problem with sexual harassment in the workplace. The Respect at Work report made 55 recommendations that will help address these problems. Labor has told us before the election that they'd fully implement all of these recommendations, and I think that's the right thing to do. One of the recommendations is to introduce a positive duty on employers to take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate unlawful sex discrimination, sexual harassment and victimisation. What does this mean? Well, employers already have a workplace health and safety responsibility to prevent sexual har harassment, and this comes under the broader duty to eliminate or manage hazards and risks to a worker's health. But the Respect at Work report highlighted how the current WHS framework is not enough. At the moment, it is focused on harassment that has already occurred. This bill will require workplaces to create a safe place to work, free of sexual harassment. This means that people can feel safer at work before they're given a reason not to. Another recommendation is to empower the Commission to assess compliance and enforce this positive duty. This means that the Commission can make sure employers comply with their legal obligations. And I'm happy to see the recommendations in the Respect at Work report have been supported by the government and appear in this bill. We're also happy the new functions that the Commission will get under this bill were fully funded in the budget. I'm a huge supporter of the Australian Human Rights Commission. They do important work on a shoestring budget, and they could be doing more, which is the tragic bit about this. Because the reason we need this bill is because we need the Commission to be able to do more. And if it's going to do more, it's got to be funded to do more. That's something that we want to see happen. We're not going to push for it now, but it's something we will continue to raise with the government. And while we are happy with the bill, it's because we are happy with how it looks on paper. It's one thing to look good on a piece of paper. It's another thing to work when it hits the factory floor. And that's why Senator Lambie and I, together with the Greens, are proposing an amendment for a review of the changes this bill will make. This review will include the new positive duty and the additional functions of the Commission. It also includes looking at the capacity of the Commission to undertake its new functions. These powers are new, and we hope we get them right the first time. But as I have said before, we are going to make mistakes. Sometimes groundbreaking changes break more than just ground. We need a statutory review in place to see if this bill actually works like we want it to. We need to know if it's operating as intended. If not, that's fine. I'm happy to make further changes down the track if we need to. What's important is that we get this right. And the only way we will know for sure if the changes we make in this place are right is if we take the time to check in and check under the hood to see how these changes are playing out in the real world. The review we are proposing within our amendment is a flexible one, and I'm happy that this has broad support. The review will be independent. It's set to take place anywhere between two to three years after the commencement of these changes. Usually a review is done no later or no earlier than a certain period. But we're proposing something different here. We've given the government some flexibility so that the review can happen when it's most appropriate. We want to make sure that the Commission will have had the time to do its important work of educating employers on this new positive duty. We also want to make sure that if an employer is not meeting its duty to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace, the Commission has had the time to use its enforcement powers. We want to make sure that the legislation is tested in the courts. This will, make two years, um, this will all may take two years to play out. It may take three, and that's why we've included some flexibility in the review. Basically, we want to make sure this bill is working well for all parties involved, employees, employers and the Commission. So that's our amendment. But there's also the issue around costs. There's been a bit of talk about the cost provision in the bill. We've heard from legal centres who represent victims of sexual harassment that this wording would stop costs being a barrier to pursuing an action. But the government didn't adopt this wording in this bill. 
the government had proposed a default position where parties bear their own costs. The government's proposed cost provisions were an important change to the status quo, but those costs of bringing an action can still be big. They can be huge if the other party is all lawyered up and happy to drag out proceedings. We weren't alone with being concerned about this. We heard from those same legal centres that they had concerns with proposed cost provisions in the bill. They were concerned this would still be a barrier to justice. And that's why we proposed an amendment that adopted the recommendation in the Respect at Work report. This is what the member for Kuyong did in the other place. And we were prepared to put forward amendments that mirrored hers because we had the same concerns. The government has heard these concerns. The Attorney General and the Minister for Women published a media release about this today. The government has decided to take this part of the, out of the bill. They've told us that they're going to consult a little more on this. The Attorney General's department will conduct an immediate review, which will be completed by May next year. They want to get this right. We want this too. And that's why we're happy to not proceed with our amendment to the cost provisions. We're happy that the government is taking the time to listen to the concerns of the legal centres and the people they represent. We're happy that they've committed to conducting a departmental review and implementing the recommendations of that review as quickly as possible. We'll see the legislation that gives effect to those recommendations here next year. And I'm looking forward to working together with the government on this issue next year so that we can get it right. So that cost is not a barrier to anyone seeking justice. Your rights aren't conditional on your bank balance. They're yours all the time. We can't accept a world where it's fine to harass somebody so long as they're poor. That's why costs can't be a barrier. And that's what they'll be so long as justice has a price tag. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Senator Watt. Uh, I thank all senators for their contributions uh, to the debate on this bill. Uh, this bill is obviously a significant milestone in delivering on the government's commitment to fully implement the Respect at Work report. It re represents a historic shift in how public policy and the legislative framework supports people who experience sexual harassment and discrimination in the workplace. Uh, I thank all of those who have been involved in the development of this, whether it be uh, Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins, uh, the members of her council, and I particularly thank those survivors who came forward to share their personal experiences which have led to this uh, uh, terrific change. Um, I'm conscious that there's a lot of people been waiting a long time for these changes to be made, so I'll leave it at that in terms of my summing up so that we can get into the committee stage. Uh, thank you, Senator Watt. Uh, the question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Waters be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Uh, those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. Uh, the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to discrimination, human rights and gender equality and for other purposes. Uh, as amendments have been circulated, the Senate resolves into committee. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. So the question is that the bill stand as printed. Uh, would anyone like to stand to move their amendments? Um, Minister. Yep. Um, I'd, do I need to take leave? Sorry. No. I move uh, the amendments listed in. I think my name uh, on sheet 1752 
And could I also table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this bill? Sorry. It's two. Yep. I was looking at the wrong part of the document. Okay. So the question before the chair. So you sought leave for something else. What was that? Okay. I was also tabling the. You didn't need to seek. Yep. Okay. So the. Leaves granted to table the supplementary documents, and the question before the chair is: Government Amendment One to Five, Sheet RV One Six Two. And the question is that amendments one to four be agreed to. Senator Cash. Thank you. Just in relation to the, co the opposition's position, the opposition will be supporting this amendment, and I appreciate the government working with the opposition in relation to these changes. Uh, these changes are important for providing certainty for Australians and Australian employers. Uh, the amendment will provide clarity and certainty for businesses and employees on the rights and obligations uh, that they are not competing between both the anti-discrimination laws as well as the work health and safety laws. Uh, we are also supportive of further clarifying the application period for the compliance notices. Minister. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. The amendments on sheet RV162 are technical refinements to provide greater certainty and clarity on the operation of the bill and to allow for additional consideration of the proposed reforms to cost protections. Um, just to outline each of those amendments, Amendment 1 relating to third parties and the positive duty, amendment, uh, this amendment would add the words by any person to the end of the headings, heading of subsections 47C, subsection 4 and 5, amending it to read other conduct towards employees and per workers by any person. The purpose of this amendment is to clarify that subsections 47 capital C, 4 and 5 cover conduct engaged in by third parties or other persons, such as customers and suppliers. This means that an employer or person conducting a business or undertaking must take measures to protect their employees or workers from certain conduct by third parties, such as customers. Um, the sense. second amendment um, would make a technical correction to the current language used in paragraph 47, subsection 6C of the Sex Discrimination Act, as inserted by the bill. Um, Amendment, Amendment 5 would add an additional subsection to the positive duty in section 47 capital C of the bill to provide that it does not limit or otherwise affect a duty that a duty holder has under Commonwealth and state or territory work health and safety laws. And Amendment 6 would provide an explicit time frame for a person to seek judicial review of a compliance notice that has been issued yes. by the Human Rights Commission uh, in relation to non-compliance with the positive duty. Um, and Amendment uh, five in relation to cost protection. This amendment would remove Schedule Five of the bill, which inserted a cost protection provision in the Australian Human Rights Commission Act. I may, in reading uh, my notes here, I may have um, misnumbered some of those amendments, um, uh, but I think I think you understand where I'm coming from. Rise on behalf of the Australian Greens to indicate. Um, that we will be supporting these government amendments. And yes, I, uh, there was a few numerical errors there, but uh, we've got the amendments in front of us and they're all uh, in, of a technical nature. Can I particularly welcome um, item one, which extends the positive duty obligations on an employer to addressing improper and harassing behaviour by uh, customers or clients or contractors. That's a very meaningful extension and a very important, uh, <clears throat> very important one. In relation to item five, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're really pleased that the government has dropped their proposed costs changes. There was real concern that this would have put barriers in the way of people accessing and enforcing these new rights. And we very much welcome the agreement that the government reached with the Greens to look more closely at these issues and indeed to look at potentially uh, making access to justice more accessible for all protected attri attributes, not just uh, for harassment on the grounds of gender. Um, and so that's why um, the joint amendment between the Greens and the Jackie Lamb Lambie Network on sheet 1700, that's why we're not moving that one today, because the government has now dropped their cost provisions and have agreed to expedite a review to ideally come to an approach where if a complainant is successful, they can get their costs awarded, but if they're not successful, they don't face that risk of having to pay their
their employers' legal costs. So that's the ideal scenario that many experts have pushed for. That's what we are hoping will be um, found in the review. But of course, we'll come back to this chamber and ideally legislate those stronger provisions in due course. Thank you. First question related to sheet RV162, which is that amendments one to four be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Now we move on to um, Senator what I think you moved uh, both parts of that amendment already. So there is the second part of that question still before the chair. Does anyone want to continue to speak to that? Okay, I can then put the question that Schedule 5 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. No, you say no. <laughs> the, that Schedule 5 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. Okay, we now have the question before the chair. Does someone want to move 1702? Senator Tyrrell. Apologies. I move amendments number one and two on sheet 1702 in the names of myself, Senator Lambie, and Senator Waters. Thank you, Senator Till. Did you want to speak to that now? Okay. The, Senator Waters. Chair, I might just speak very, very briefly to that amendment, which is a joint amendment between the Greens and the Jackie Lambie Network. Um, and I thank the government for their indication that they will support this amendment. Um, this amendment would require a comprehensive review of the operation of the Act, so not just a review of the cost provisions, which we've also reached agreement with the government on, but a broader review of the operation of the whole Act to make sure that it's delivering um, on its intentions, to make sure that employers and employees have the support and guidance that they need for the operation of these provisions. Um, and we commend these amendments to the, House, uh, to the Chamber. Thank you, Senator Waters. The question, oh, Senator Watt. Um, Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I can confirm the government will be accepting this amendment. The question is that Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much. In terms of the position of the opposition, the coalition will support this amendment. An independent review with a report to the parliament will ensure we can make any changes necessary to ensure any deficiency in these amendments are identified and puts forward a pathway to address these potential issues. It is important these significant changes are reviewed for how they are operating, and for this reason, the coalition will be supporting the review. The question is that sheet, amendments on sheet 1702 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Senator Waters. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I rise to move by leave uh, amendments one to five on sheet 1712 together. Leaves granted. Thank you. Yeah. I might just briefly just outline the nature of these amendments. So items one to three pertain to amending the hostile workplace environment provisions. Now, as drafted, the bill's hostile work environment provisions apply primarily to interactions between individuals. One person must be directly subject, uh, must directly subject another person to the hostile environment, but requiring this nexus fails to clearly target those who create or perpetuate a hostile work environment, as opposed to those whose behaviour um, is encouraged by that environment. But individuals who discriminate or harass will already be captured by other sections, uh, 28 capital A and 28 double capital A. Um, so unless it's made clear that section 28M goes beyond individuals to those creating the environment in which misconduct is fostered, 28M will not achieve its aims. So we think this is an amendment that um, gives effect to the genuine intent of the Jenkins recommendation, uh, and it's clear that strong and clear 
hostile work environment provisions would assist the bill to achieve its key aim. So we particularly commend amendments one to three. Um, I understand that uh, we will not be receiving support for those amendments, which is precisely why we need a review of this bill. So I'm pleased that the previous amendment uh, did pass, and I'd flag that we'll be uh, progressing uh, clarity-style amendments along these lines uh, when that review uh, is underway. Can I briefly outline what uh, amendment uh, item four does. Um, the steps needed to create a safe workplace will differ between workplaces and industries. And in our view, staff are best placed to identify the key risks in their workplace and how to address them. So for this reason, staff should be consulted as part of the positive duty obligations to ensure that what an employer is doing is targeted and is effective. So if employers are serious about making workplaces safer, they do actually need to talk to their staff about particular risks in their workplace and what should be done to address them. And many employers will do that. Sadly, others will not. Uh, they need to report, employers need to report on the actions that they take, and they need to regularly review whether those actions are actually working. Anything else is just lip service. So um, that's why we've drafted our amendments uh, to that effect, to, to um, require employers to talk with their staff and, and regularly report on um, if the positive duty is, is actually uh, properly being implemented. Um, the bill requires the Human Rights Commission to publish guidelines on how to comply with the positive duty. So our amendment also gives those guidelines some teeth by, having, uh, by requiring the employer to have regard to them. Um, in and the Commission itself to have regard to those guidelines in determining whether an employer has met that duty. Uh, and item five, the Human Rights Commission has requested this change in the inquiry on the bill. The Human Rights Commission can issue compliance notices to employers that they believe are not meeting their positive duty obligations. Um, the employer can then do nothing. Um, or they can dispute the notice, or they can respond to the notice and enter into an enforceable undertaking, setting out what changes they will make. The, AR, the AHRC can currently publish those enforceable undertakings, but they are not uh, permitted under this bill to publish those compliance notices. And it's our view that allowing compliance notices, that first notice, to be published with giving the Commission the discretion to publish them would improve the transparency for employees and the guidance for other employers. It's important that employers know that um, these changes have teeth and that people are watching. And If the Commission has served a compliance notice, it is in the public interest, in my view, for people to know about that. Uh, that's why we think the Commission should be given the discretion to publish those compliance notices, not just the subsequent enforcement notices when the compliance notice has been ignored. So we commend those amendments to the Chamber. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Um, the government will not be accepting the amendments circulated by Senator Waters in relation uh, to these uh, provisions. I won't. Comprehensive reasons for the government's position were given in the House, and I would refer people to those reasons for more detail. But in brief, uh, in relation to the hostile work environment uh, amendment, uh, the government considers this amendment is not necessary, as substantial contribution to the creation or maintenance of a hostile work environment would already be covered by what it means to subject someone to a hostile work environment. The amendments would also broaden the protected attributes that would be covered by the prohibition on hostile work environments, and this is beyond the scope of what was recommended by the Respect at Work report and beyond the scope of this bill. This bill is really about delivering the Respect at Work report recommendations, and that's what we're doing, and we're not going beyond that, which is what this amendment seeks to do. In terms of the positive duty matters to be taken into account amendment, that would add two further factors to be considered by the Human Rights Commission when determining whether someone has complied with the positive duty. Um, these amendments are not necessary. The Commission's guidelines would inform their assessment of compliance with the positive duty. It's not necessary to legislate for this. Finally, uh, the amendment in relation to positive duty publication of compliance notices. The amendments put forward would provide the President of the Human Rights Commission with the power to publish a compliance notice on the Commission's website. This amendment is not supported, as it may be counterproductive to the objective of achieving compliance with the positive duty. As I say, uh, comprehensive uh, reasons were provided for the government's position in opposing these amendments, but that just sums it up in, in very much in brief.
Senator Cash. Thank you. Um, the opposition will also not be supporting these amendments, and uh, in the House, on behalf of the opposition, comprehensive reasons were given in relation to why, very briefly, uh, this bill is not the appropriate vehicle for the changes proposed in the amendments. Uh, the respected work report responded to workplace sexual harassment. As such, the legislative responses to that report have focused on sexual harassment uh, rather than harassment on the basis of all the protected characteristics in the Sex Discrimination Act. So the question is that amendments, Senator Waters. Yes, can I just put on record that I disagree with that flimsy reasoning, um, and that these amendments weren't even raised in the House. So I find it hard to believe the comprehensive response has already been given. But I'll just register my discontent and move on. The question is that amendments one to five on sheet one seven two be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. Australian yes, Senator Greens. Waters. Thank you, Chair. Can I ask that the Australian Greens support for our own amendments be recorded in the Hansard, uh, but we won't be seeking to call a division given the time pressures of the day. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Yes, thank you. I now uh, move uh, Amendment 6 on Sheet 1712. Um, now, this relates to um, the ability for state employees to seek a remedy under the uh, Federal Sex Discrimination Act. Uh, the welcome repeal of Section 13 of the Sex Discrimination Act um, by the uh, Respect at Work Bill of 2021 removed the restriction that had prevented state government employees accessing remedies under the Commonwealth regime, but the repeal was not made retrospective. And this meant that a number of state government employees remained locked out of seeking justice. Section 47A, which was introduced at the same time and allowed civil action for victimising conduct, was given retrospective effect in recognition of the justice denied to victims by that option not having been made available previously. The same right should be extended to those uh, excluded by Section 13. Um, it would still be subject to the statute of limitations as, um, as a reasonable time limit on claims, um, and that's why we are seeking uh, to move this amendment to redress that inequity and that inconsistency. Senator Watt. Um, thank you. Again, the government will be opposing this amendment. The government doesn't support making uh, amendments from the Respect at Work Act last year retrospective in operation. Uh, the Respect at Work Act 2021 repealed Section 13 of the Sex Discrimination Act to ensure that state and territory employees were able to make complaints of sex discrimination and sexual harassment under the Commonwealth Sex Discrimination Act. The amendments to Section 13 last year did not apply retrospectively because they created a new form of liability that didn't previously exist. Retrospective operation is only appropriate in very limited circumstances. Uh, that's a long-standing principle. Uh, each state and territory has anti-discrimination laws prohibiting sexual harassment and sex discrimination, providing an avenue for state and territory employees to make a complaint for conduct that occurred prior to the amendments at the Commonwealth level last year. What does that mean? The question is that Amendment 6 on Sheet 1712 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Senator Waters. Chair, again, in the interests uh, of time pressures in the chamber, can I ask, rather than dividing the position of the Australian Greens supporting that amendment be recorded? Thank you for that courtesy. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And I rise to move opposition amendments 1 to 11 on sheet 1752 by leave together. Is leave granted? Leave's, leaves granted. Senator Cash. Uh, just very briefly, some comments in relation to the amendments. Uh, proposed section 28M does not include the words in relation to. Uh, this merely brings the text into line with existing obligations. As currently drafted, the proposed prohibition may extend to instances where the complainant has no exposure to the conduct that causes the hostile work environment. In practice, this may mean that an employee could make a complaint under proposed section 28M without ever being in the vicinity of the alleged conduct. We've introduced Amendment 1 to ensure the relevant conduct occurs in relation to the second person. Our proposed section 28M includes the words after the conduct occurs. Given the possibility of large organisations with workplaces distributed across multiple locations, it is important that the person was in the workplace at the time that the conduct occurred. Uh, and we have introduced Amendment 2 to delete the words after the conduct occurs, just in relation to the positive duty. 
Section 47C would require employers and persons conducting the business undertaking to take measures to eliminate as far as possible certain conduct under work health and safety law. The obligation imposed on PCBUs is to ensure the health and safety of their workers as far as is reasonably practicable. We have introduced amendments 3 and 5 to bring this provision uh, within the well understood existing position of industrial laws um, or industrial relations law by using the formulation as far as reasonably practicable, uh, shifting the enforcement inquiries to the uh, Fair Work Ombudsman in order to avoid regulatory overlap and duplications in compliance regimes. Uh, we have proposed to shift the enforcement powers for the positive duty to the Fair Work Ombudsman. We have proposed to shift the inquiry powers to the Fair Work Ombudsman to prevent an employer being investigated by more than one body in relation to the same conduct and to avoid any conflict between the conciliation and inquiry functions of the Australian Human Rights Commission. Just in terms of representative actions, uh, there already exists a mechanism by which representative actions can be brought in the Federal Court of Australia. Um, allowing a party who is not an aggrieved party to have a standing to commence a claim, uh, as this provision does, uh, is a significant departure from Australia's class uh, action laws. Uh, representative groups are not prohibited from providing financial or legal support to parties pursuing a representative proceedings in the court. Rather, they are simply prevented from commencing the proceedings uh, on their behalf. Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Uh, the amendments moved by the opposition bear no resemblance to the actual recommendations of the Respect at Work report, and so the government will not be supporting them. Senator Waters. Thanks, Chair. Can I indicate that the Australian Greens will be opposing these provisions, um, particularly items one to two, which would change the hostile work environment provisions to require that the conduct be directed at a complainant. The individual complainant approach defeats the purpose of having provisions creating a workplace and cultural change approach. So it, um, it just wrong way, go back. Um, items three to four would weaken the positive duty by requiring employers to do simply what is reasonably practical rather than what is possible to make the workplace safe. We won't support a weakening of the positive duty. Um, the proposal to give compliance powers to the Fair Work Org rather than um, AHRC would um, fly in the face of Jenkins' recommendations, uh, which identified the AHRC as the best compliance agency given its expertise. Um, again, the item 10 to scrap the representative actions provisions. Representative actions are a key reform in allowing complainants, uh, complaints to be made without exposing individual workers. Um, and lastly, the proposal in item 11 to revert to the previous government's weak version of the objectives clause, which would change, uh, which would seek equality of opportunity rather than substantive equality. Well, structural gender inequality is not simply about denial of opportunity. It reflects how discrimination, stereotypes and other factors can affect people's capacity to take up opportunities. So the goal of substantive equality recognises that opportunities need to be offered dif uh, differently in some circumstances in order to overcome structural barriers and achieve substantive equality. So for all those reasons, we won't be supporting any of these amendments. Amendments 1 to 6, 8 to 9 on sheet 1752 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Four minutes. Four minutes. Two So the next one.
Lock the doors. Senator Cash has moved amendments 1 to 11 on sheet 1753. I'm required to put order. I'm required to put those amendments by two questions. The first question, I will take you through the questions before I put them. The first question is that the amendments 1, 2, 6, 8 and 9 be agreed to, and, and regardless of outcome, I will then put the second question, which will be that items 17 to 22, 24 to 25 of Schedule 2, Schedule 4 and item 2 of Schedule 8, standards printed, and item 23 of Schedule 2. So I intend to proceed unless any senator has a question. I put the question that amendments 1 to 6, 8 and 9 be agreed to. Those for the question passed to the right of the chair, those against to the left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the aye, Senator Scar, and teller for the nose, Senator Shikoni.
Senators, there being 24 ayes and 32 noes, it's passed in the negative. I remind honourable senators that I'm now putting up, I will be putting the second question. I put that question that items 17 to 22, 24 and 25 of Schedule 2, Schedule 4, and item 2 of Schedule 8 stand as printed and as amended, and that item 23 of Schedule 2. I put the question. Those, um, Put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I think the the ayes have it. Are there any other contributions in relation in the committee stage? I'll now put the question that the bill stand as amended. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Does any other senator have a contribution? I now put the questions. The, we'll take us out of committee. The question is now that the bill, as amended, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Honourable Senators, the committee has com considered the anti-discrimination and human rights legislation amendment, Respect at Work Bill 2022, and agreed to it with amendments. Uh, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a third time. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clark. Oh. I'll let the clerk finish that. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to discrimination, human rights and gender equality and for other purposes. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the government's management of its legislative program. Is leave granted? Leave has been refused. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, th thanks, Deputy President. Uh, pursuant to contingent notice uh, standing in my name, I move that so much the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion relating to the government's management of its legislative program. I believe the motion is being circulated. Whilst it's being circulated. Yes, please, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Deputy President. Now, I move that the Senate notes A. The disastrous negotiations on the financial accountability regime, Bill 2022, and associated bills conducted by the Assistant Treasurer, which plagued the financial industry with more uncertainty, and B. Fundamental mistakes and miscalculations in the regulatory impact statement to the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022 demonstrate that the Albanese Labor government is pursuing a rushed and chaotic approach instead of a proper and transparent approach for such extreme reforms. And two, a message be sent to the House of Representatives seeking its concurrence with paragraph one of this resolution. And three, the Fair Work Legislation Amendment, Secure Jobs, Better Pay Bill 2022 be referred to the Education and Employment Legislation Committee for inquiry and report on the first sitting day of 2023. Deputy, Deputy President, what we have heard during the course of this week, during Senate question time, has been an endless litany from this government uh, of failure to admit that the rushed approach to its extreme IR legislation is an approach riddled with mistakes, riddled with mistakes, Deputy President, and an approach, of course, that will have dire consequences for businesses, particularly small and medium-sized businesses across the Australian economy. 
The mistakes in the regulatory impact statement uh, of the government are such, Deputy President, that it is clear this government has not done its homework on the IR bills that they are seeking to ram and rush through this parliament next week. Well, the truth is they didn't take these reforms to an election. They didn't take them to the Australian people. They didn't tell them in up in front what they were going to do. This is a government that instead, in its early days, decided that they would try to drive through the parliament reforms not informed and try to make sure that in doing so they are able to deliver for their union friends that which they weren't game to tell the Australian people about beforehand. And what we've heard is that the regulatory impact statement miscalculated, miscalculated elements of the costs to small and medium-sized businesses. And then indeed, as every day has gone by, we understand more and more costs will be racked up and applied to Australian small and medium businesses as a result of the government's approach. That in miscalculating those costs, in miscalculating those costs, it was in part because they were based on a few Google searches, it seems. A few Google searches of some of the most curious and unusual businesses that you could seek to base an economic analysis upon. It is embarrassing indeed, Senator Scar. It's embarrassing and it might be funny. It might be funny that the government is relying upon shamans or dog grooming services as an equation for the whole economy, psychics or magicians. It might be funny if it wasn't so serious in terms of the consequences of the government's legislation. The consequences of the government's legislation will be to see Australian businesses face costs and disruption, costs in terms of the regulatory impact, costs in terms of the cost of negotiating, disruption in terms of the increased strike action and the being forced being forced to act in ways that are not analogous to the needs of their individual enterprise or business. Jobs will be lost. And that, the consequence of that, higher costs, higher strikes, more disruption, will indeed, as Senator Dunningham said, see jobs lost. Fewer jobs in the Australian economy, higher costs on businesses. Contrary to what the government claims, it's not going to help productivity, it's going to hurt productivity. When you've got businesses tied up in red tape, dealing with strikes, productivity will go down. Costs will go up. Is it going to help or hurt inflation? It will drive inflation. It will make a difficult situation, a real problem, even worse. The government's actions will make the problem worse. They should indeed be listening to the Reserve Bank. They should be listening to the experts. They should be listening to any business across the country, not just what we've heard in this chamber this week, but remarkably in the other place. When the Minister for Small Business was asked to name one small business, just one, who supported the government's extreme IR bills, guess what? She couldn't even name one. Not even one. And as if the chaos, as if the hapless management of the industrial relations bill by this government isn't bad enough, we've been exposed in recent days to the work of the Assistant Treasurer, to the way in which the Assistant Treasurer is conducting his negotiations on the financial accountability regime bill in which he seems to be changing position on that bill on a daily basis right. and doing it all through the media. One day there are new fines, the next day those fines are being taken away. Where's the certainty for Australian business? Where's the certainty for Australian investors? What on earth is this government doing? Well, they're making these mistakes because of the undue haste and because they are dancing to the tune of their union masters. That's why these mistakes are happening, why the IR bill is no doubt full of other mistakes that are yet to be exposed because of the rushed approach, and why the financial services bill equally is being changed on a day-to-day -day basis because the government is dancing to the tune of others, trying to twist around to make sure it keeps the unions happy, the industry super funds happy. They're the ones telling them, go harder, go faster on these reforms, but they're not doing their homework, they're not getting it right. And as a consequence, Australians are going to face higher costs, fewer jobs, a weaker economy, and we won't stand for it, Deputy President. Senator Wong, you the call. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, the week is ending as it started, with the Liberal National Party doing everything they can not to help Australian workers get a pay increase. Not to help Australian workers getting a, get a pay increase. It's the the same strategy, the same strategy with which they started the week, 
uh, with which they started the week. Oh, yeah, you know, would you like to stand up and make a contribution? You know, really, because we just, we, we, you know, no amount of slagging off the trade union yeah, movements. No, it's not an invitation. Oh. I'm the one who gives the invitation. Oh. Senator Wong, and I thought you and, wanted me to talk and, about the uh, secret Senator dirty Wong, rotten Senator Wong, deal. Senator Wong. That's hurting every employer Senator, Senator Henderson, in this please country. Sit down. Please sit down. This is, a, this is an open-ended debate. No amount of slagging off working people will, will, will remove a, get away from the fact that you stand in the way of wage increases for, for ordinary Australians. Oh, yeah, I Senator know it's a Henderson, dreadful thing, isn't it? You have a point it? of order, do you? Oh, you're on direct relevance. I just wanted to point out the only one that I'm slagging off is this government. No, that's, sit for, down. that's not a point of order. That's not a point of order. Please be seated, Senator Wong. Uh, tactical Senator. genius over there. But look, um, what I would say is this. Yet again, yet again, we see this, this Liberal National Party, the dregs of, of government, doing the only thing they know how to unite on, and that is to stand up against working people. That is the only thing this divided, this divided remnants of a hapless government can actually do together is to stand up stand up against working people and that is what you have consistently done all week it's the one thing that unites you it's the one thing that unites you you know we we, we, we love a, a deliberate design feature of our economy being low wages and we're going to hold on to it oh we're going to fight really hard to hold on to it uh, and that is what is that is what has occurred all week and that is what is occurring now because the the part of the motion that is before the senate that really demonstrates uh, what the motivation of those opposite uh, is all about is they want to defer debate uh, on the fair work legislation. Secured jobs, better pay, better pay bill. Oh, well, I'll take the interjection from the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate. Uh, he says he just wants more time, he wants more scrutiny. Does anyone believe, anyone believe that those opposite, the party of work choices, will ever change? will ever change. I mean, I, I was here for the work choices debate, and I see the same fervour in their eyes now. You know, this is the thing that unites them best. How is it that we can gang up, gang up against workers, and how can we bash the trade union movement? That is what unites you, and that is what this motion is all about. Let's remember that the bill that they don't, so desperately don't want to debate expressly, expressly prohibits sexual harassment, puts gender equity and job security at the heart of the Fair Work Commission's decision-making, bans pay secrecy clauses. You say you care about uh, you say you care senator henderson you say you care about pay equity senator but you're henderson. defending pay secrecy of, clauses excuse me senator wong senator oh, look, i, I did take the point of order on the fact that senator wong wasn't referring her comments through the chair but this, she then when i stood up added senator All right, henderson thank you. Senator, so just senator to wong. remind for this debate and you're wasting time. Good on you. Yeah. Very, very Senator White, sensitive. You're not assisting. Really so sensitive. More genius. Yeah, very happy to dish it out, but doesn't like it when people call it out. Doesn't like it when people call it out, do you? The reality you dish it out across the chamber to the president, Anything but you don't like it when people call you out. You don't uh, you don't like it when people Never call you right out. Time for a pay you know, those opposites say they care about pay equity. Well this bill seeks to deal with some of those pay equity issues by banning pay secrecy clauses and giving the Fair Work Commission the powers to deal with pay equity. This is the bill they're fighting so hard against. New limits on rolling contracts, wow. another equity provision. I mean, there are all these aspects of the legislation that they do not wish to debate. They do not wish to debate. They want the debate to be about just one thing because they don't actually want to deal with the real issue, which is at its heart, this bill is about trying to make Australian workplaces fairer and trying to get wages moving again. That is what this bill is about. And you cannot join with that issue, can you? You cannot join with that issue because fundamentally you don't agree with it. Fundamentally you don't agree with it. Uh, you don't agree with it. 
you are committed, no matter how much debate, how much so-called scrutiny, you are ideologically, historically and forever committed to, to opposing this bill. Uh, and you haven't learned, I mean, we all remember in the last election a dollar pay increase and, and the way in which your the, then government responded. Australians remember that, and what is clear from the way in which you have dealt with this debate on this bill is you haven't learned the lesson. You haven't learned the lesson. Yeah. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, the Australian Greens do not support the question before the chair, and I do want to make some comments about the financial accountability regime bill negotiations. But before I do, I want to be abundantly clear that the Australian Greens certainly do not support uh, the Fair Work Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill being referred to a committee for an inquiry that is both needless and designed only to delay, and neither, neither do we accept that the management of the chamber this week has been chaotic. In fact, it has been very productive, and we genuinely hope that next week will be the same. Now, on the financial accountability regime bill, on Tuesday this week at about six o'clock, Minister Jones and I met in his office and we made an agreement. That agreement was that the Greens would facilitate the passage this year of the Treasury Laws Amendment Bill No. 2, the Treasury Laws Amendment Bill No. 3 and the Financial Accountability Regime Bill and its cognate bills. The condition, the condition that on which that was agreed was that the government would support the Greens amendment order, to the Financial order, Accountability the Regime Bill 2022 to insert civil penalties for accountable people, including bank executives, for breaches of their accountability obligations. That would have been a great step forward. Yesterday, Minister Jones and I met again in his office, and he informed me that the government was no longer prepared to honour that agreement. Now we all know, we all know what's happened here. Labor has cracked under pressure from the bank executives, and reneging on the agreement shows very clearly that Labor values the interests of bankers over the interests of customers of banks. And Minister Jones has learned very clearly what happens when you get in between a bank executive and a bag of money. He's learned that you get absolutely steamrolled, and that's what's happened to him this week. There is absolutely no doubt that Minister Jones and I had an agreement, and any claim that there was no agreement is false. I can also inform the Senate that yesterday evening I wrote to Minister Jones offering a revised agreement in which the Australian Greens would facilitate the passage of the relevant bills this year on the basis that the government would support a revised amendment which would ensure that small and mutual banks and, importantly, executives of small and mutual banks are not unreasonably impacted. For clarity, this means that executives of small and mutual banks would not be subject to civil penalties for breaches of their accountability obligations. In other words, we would be going squarely after the top end of town where this kind of reform is so desperately needed to send a clear message to the, to the executives of the big banks in this country that their poor behaviour, their appalling culture, uh, that was uncovered by a once-in-a-generation Royal Commission will not be tolerated any longer. We hope the government is prepared to accept our revised offer, which we make in good faith despite what's happened in the last 24 hours. We look forward to the government's response. Yeah. Uh, Senator I'm going to give the call to Senator Roberts because he is entitled to give his view, and then I'll give you the call. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sorry, Acting Deputy, Thank Mr. Ac Deputy President. Sorry, sir. I, uh, He's a member of the cross. He's an independent. Well, I'm, I'm in the hands of the chamber, but yeah. Is, if there's no agreement on that side, I've had to do this before. The yeah. next, the next speaker would then be from the government. Yeah. That's right.
I'm in the hands of the chaplain. Perhaps. Do that and did seek the call. Uh, About a minute or two. Did we have All right, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. This is the Fair Work Act. We see an amazing bill coming through now involving a lot of parts, parts, 27 parts. Some require some are just simply necessary tidying up. We support them. Some are worthy improvements. We support them. Some are big issues that are not thought through. Some are big issues that are thought through but appear to be hiding things. Some are designed deliberately, it appears, to confuse, to obfuscate. We need more time to scrutinise this. The government has said that this is about pay increase. Rubbish. They have left out my equal pay, equal pay for equal work bill. And that is fundamental to getting more pay for workers. We cannot add complexity to this already complex dinosaur, the Fair Work Act, without proper scrutiny. That's the only way to do this. I support the, uh, the uh, move to suspend standing orders and will be supporting uh, the motion. Senator Cash. Thank you. And I also support the Leader of the Opposition uh, in the Senate's motion to support standing orders for this reason. In the first instance, I have to say, I have to say Senator McKim, the revelations that you have just provided to the Senate, I was unaware of. A deal has allegedly been done between a government minister and assistant deals done for your, with chief. yourself, and a deal has been broken. Seriously, seri did the minister even have authority to do the deal with you? Now begs the question. That minister should today at least have the decency to front the press and actually confirm whether or not a deal was done. Because in this place, let's be honest, if a deal is done, you stick with the deal. And it would appear that Stephen Jones, the Assistant Treasurer, did not have the authority, Senator McKim, to do the deal with you. I don't know what the deal was. I may not even agree with the deal, but I have to say the revelation that a deal was done demands that the Assistant Treasurer front the media today and give an explanation to the Australian people. Now, now why do I say that? Because you see, Mr Deputy President, this is a government that was elected on a basis of integrity and transparency. And as the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate has said, what this motion does is merely allow further scrutiny in relation to possibly the biggest industrial relations changes this country has seen for decades and decades and decades. It doesn't ask for that scrutiny to be extended in an unreasonable time frame. In fact, what it says is basically give us a Christmas period to go out there, talk further to employers, because every employer in the country, and we all need to remember this, governments don't create jobs. Employers do. And when you have every employer in the country standing up and saying, we agree with wage rises, we have nothing against wage rises, but this bill will not deliver wage rises, I would have thought you sit back for five minutes and you just listen. But for the benefit of those in the gallery, this is the contempt with which the Albanese government treats businesses in Australia. This is with the contempt. They have actually utilised a website to calculate costs for small business that is called How Much Should I Charge a Consultant in Australia? Now, sounds reasonable. Until you click on the link in the regulatory impact statement and the person, the author of the article, colleagues, as we know, is described as this. A cross between a business strategist, modern day spiritual healer and self development expert, Benjamin J. Harvey, and good on Benjamin J. Harvey, is as comfortable working with shamans to strategists, psychics to sales reps, healers to homemakers, Buddhists to businessmen, and meditators to mediators. And what does the government do? The government says, Sorry, it was a mistake, and throws their own department under a bus. Interestingly, though, it is interesting, colleagues, because you see the figure of $175 per hour was actually the same figure that 
Benjamin J. Harvey's website came no up. No So I have to start wondering, wondering whether or not, whether or not just merely throwing the department under the bus was a right thing to do. But colleagues, it actually gets worse in terms of contempt, in terms of contempt for business. Because as we know, there is a fundamental, a fundamental mistake in the RIS in relation to the bargaining tax, the bargaining tax that medium-sized businesses will actually pay. They have miscalculated it by $5,000, and the bad news is it isn't $5,000 less. It's not $70,000 that uh, medium businesses will be paying. It actually now goes up to $80,000. And do you know what the minister, the relevant minister, said in relation to that, colleagues? Tell on an, a $5,000 mistake. When it increases the cost from business from $75 to $80,000, I kid you not, it is a mere typo. Oh. A mere typo. Oh. So to all those businesses who have 16 employees, 17 employees, 18 employees, 19 employees and 20 employees, I can tell you, your Christmas present from the left-wing Albanese government is that the additional $5,000 that you will have to pay for the pleasure of being compelled to bargain a bargaining tax $5,000. I don't know where you're finding this $5,000 with every other cost that is being imposed on you. But the contempt, the contempt that those have opposite to say that a $5,000 increase is a typo Thank takes wide as motion Cash. to be. Well, well nothing, nothing symbolises more how lost this crowd are on industrial relations than Senator Cash. The former workplace relations minister Nobody is more responsible over on that side for a government that had the longest period of historically low wage growth in our history ever, ever. Since Federation, these guys presided over the lowest period of wage growth in our history, the lowest period of productivity growth in our history. And why? Because what they see industrial relations and workplace reform through is only one thing. They can't stand the union movement. That's all they care about. They're not interested in anything more. It's a one-eyed, prejudiced, blinkered, ideological view about Australian workplaces that can only see one thing. And when there's a little bit of legislation put in front of you, moderate, moderate, sensible, Order. practical, straightforward, Order. internationally comparable, what are you doing? What are you doing? Well, I'll tell you what you're doing. A point of you're order, Senator there. Mayors. Point of order, Senator Cash. Point of order is in relation to the Assistant Minister clearly misleading the Chamber. If he thinks that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Senator pages Cash, please be of seated. Sit down, Senator Cash. Senator Cash. Senator Cash, please be seated. Senator Ayres. And call. you know what? The international evidence demonstrates this. The international evidence demonstrates this. What does this legislation lead to? Multi-employer bargaining leads to more employment. It leads to lower unemployment. It leads to better jobs. It leads to higher wages. It leads to higher productivity. It leads to less gender inequality. But you guys aren't remotely interested, not remotely interested in any of that. I tell you what, you don't your, your relationship with the concept of productivity is so broken. I mean, what you've got here is a government that's doing what it said it was going to do and is legislating, legislating its agenda. And the only thing that you're doing, the only thing that you're doing is trying to break the productivity of this parliament. Because what's going on, what's going on doesn't suit your political timetable. That's what this is really about. What you want is months and months and months to run a dishonest, dishonest, partisan political scare campaign and talk about the sort of dishonesties that you and you and you are out there saying in Australian workplaces trying to frighten, trying to frighten ordinary small business owners out there. Now these propositions, these propositions are very straightforward, very simple to understand. And I'll give you an example of how simple to understand they are. There's this outfit, this outfit called the OECD. You, you lot might have heard of it. 
You might have heard of it. It's run by a fella who used to loaf around over here. Order who used to loaf left. around over here trying to keep Australian wages down. That's what former Senator Cormann did. Tried to keep Australian wages down. But the outfit that he leads, with one of the most respected economic analysis outfits in the world, makes the proposition very simple. They say multi-employer bargaining is a cornerstone industrial relations institution in 18 out of 26 OECD countries. 18 out of 26 OECD countries. And it is a cornerstone not just of their industrial relations system, but it's also a cornerstone Order. of their macroeconomic Order. system. I mean, honestly. Come on, you, you have a go. But, I mean, honestly. It's a cornerstone of their economic systems. It's a cornerstone of their productivity systems. And what it leads to is higher employment, lower unemployment, more jobs, good jobs, more cooperation in workplaces over issues like skills. It leads to higher productivity. It leads to lower gender inequality. Now, which bit, which bit of that don't you lot want to have? Which bit of that don't you lot want to have? The fact is the modern Liberal Party has lost their way on productivity. You've lost your way on the issues that matter for Australian businesses and Australian workers, and nothing represents that more than the miserable stunt that you lot have engaged in today. Uh, Senator McGrath, then I'll come to Senator Shaw. What we find out today is that federal Labor are bringing in a payroll tax at a federal level on small businesses. What they're doing is they're going to charge small businesses point, tens point of, of order, thousands sir. of dollars. As, as I understand it, time's expired for this debate. I've got, a, I've got about, a, about two minutes. Sorry, Senator. Senator. Can I have some order? Order. Can you sit down, Senator McGrath? You are really pushing, pu pushing the boundaries here. No, it is unacceptable behaviour, and I'm about to address it. Senator McGrath, that was completely out of order. I'm not going to give you the call. I'm going to give the call to Senator Ayres for the last two minutes. No, sorry, Senator Ayres. Uh, Senator Shilton, my apologies. Good, I set you. you down because of your behaviour. And this is, and this is a, this is a I, thing. They don't want to hear from small business because if they actually had read the report into this bill, they would have seen the small business, both H HVAC, small business operators, said they want multi-employer bargaining because they want productivity increase. They want there to be a better opportunity to build wages, to turn around and share the opportunity for productivity. That is the sort of answer that we want to build this country. Wages go up. Productivity goes up. These are opportunities that make a change for everybody. It means wages improve, productivity improves. But what have they constantly been about? You have to look at Mr. Senator Birmingham. He turns around and supported on the insiders that we should have an decrease in wages because, as far as he's concerned, he wants the same system applying. That's what they're about. They want wages suppressed. But then look at Angus Taylor yesterday on the ABC. He's declaring individual contracts as the best way to go. They want to go back to work choices. But the difference is they've allowed work choices to apply right Thank now. You, Senator Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. I'm putting the question. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. I think the noes have it. A division required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Birmingham to suspend be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Scar as seller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as seller for the noes. Order, there being 30 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Now going back to government business, I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number four, social services and other legislation amendment incentivising pensioners to downsize bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Just allow senators to leave the chamber those who aren't engaged in any debates. And I shall give the call to Senator Dunning. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And uh, to take the tone down a few notches, uh, I rise to provide a contribution on the social services and other legislation amendment incentivising pensioners downsize. Bill 2022. And I'd like to, at the outset, indicate the Coalition's support for this piece of legislation. Uh, the bill amends the Social Security Act 1991 and the Veterans Entitlements Act 1986 to support pensioners or other eligible income Senator support Dunning, recipients. So, I'm yes. sorry, Senator Dunning. Senators at the back of the chamber, I can just about hear word for word your conversations, and Senator Dunning is trying to make a contribution. Thank you, Senator Dunning. Thank you, Acting. Deputy President, it's um, obviously hard to regain composure as a collective, and we shall do that now. So I'm going to put on the serious and sensitive now. Uh, but this bill, which we support, uh, and I'm almost at the end of my contribution here now. Um, I'm coming quite near to the end of my analysis of this legislation, and uh, which is amazing. Um, during, so it supports pensioners or other eligible income support recipients during the sale, purchase and purchase of a new home by one, extending the existing assets test exemption for principal home sale proceeds, which a person intends to use to purchase a new principal home from 12 to 24 months, and secondly, applying only the lower below threshold deeming rate to these asset test exempt, exempt principal home sale proceeds when calculating deemed income. Two important elements, and for that reason, the coalition supports the bill. Thank you, Senator Dunian. Senator Brockman, no, off the list. Okay. Oh, Se Senator Rice. Seeing I was second on the list initially, um, look, I also rise to support to speak in support of the Social Services Other Legislation Amendment, incentivising pensioners to downsize Bill 2022. We will be supporting this bill, but it is another 
very, very, very small step forward in terms of the social services and social security agenda. It's another election commitment from the Labor Party. It's another election commitment that was effectively bipartisan between the Labor and the Libs. Um, with the Labor Party competing with the Liberal Party to do just enough tweaking of our social services legislation to make sure that the Liberals can't run another scare campaign to say that the Labor Party are abandoning older, older Australians. But meanwhile, the system is broken. While the Labor Party is tweaking it with minor changes, and in fact we don't even know how many pensioners are likely to take this up, and the estimates that I've heard is probably not very many, as much as it's you know, a good measure. While the Labor Party is tweaking it with minor changes, it's a basically a liberal election commitment. People are relying on income support payments that are below the poverty line. People are going hungry. People are homeless. People can't afford to pay the rent. People can't afford to, have to pay their medical bills to seek the medical treatment that they need. People are turning off the lights and the heating because they are afraid of the bills. These are the big issues, the big changes to our social security system that should be addressing. And across the country, there are people, whether they are people on job seeker, youth allowance, student allowance, the disability support pension, and age pensioners who are relying on income support, who had hoped, they had dearly hoped that a change in government would mean a change in policy. They had hoped that it would mean a change for their lives. It's almost the end of the year. This government has now been in government for six months, and across the country, what I'm hearing, what I, a lot of us are hearing, is disappointment. So let me say clearly to the Labor Party, we want to work with you on this. We want to see a government bill before this parliament that raises the rate of income support and actually makes the genuine changes to our social security system that is needed. Genuine change that will benefit people who are the most marginalised, who are the poorest people in the country, the people who are starving, the people who are being diagnosed with malnutrition and with scurvy. But we want to work with you, but we are not going to sit quietly and just tick off on minor tweaks and let you ignore the millions of people who are condemned to live in poverty by the political choices that you are making. Because that is the simple reality. Poverty is a political choice. The government, while it's tweaking incentivising pensioners to downsize, has made a choice to not reverse the stage three tax cuts, which are going to cost the budget $250 billion over the next 10 years. This government has made a choice to be giving that $250 billion to the billionaires, to the ultra-wealthy, to the people that do not need a tax cut. And meanwhile, people are being quagmired in poverty. They have chosen to keep those tax cuts instead of raising the rate of job seeker. We, this bill is incentivising pensioners to downsize, but it is a bill which is amending the social services and other legislation. Uh, the Social Services Bill. So I am going to be taking the opportunity, as I said yesterday, as I said earlier this week, I and the Greens will be taking every opportunity to be attempting to take action to increase the rate of income support for the millions of people who are now living in poverty. So I do have a second reading motion on sheet 1682 that I foreshadow I will be moving, mm -hmm. calling on the Senate to lift the rate of income support payments above the poverty line. And I call on every senator who cares about their fellow Australians, who cares that there are people who are homeless, who can't pay the rent, who can't put food on the table, who can't pay their medical bills, who care about them. I call upon every senator in this place to please support this amendment. Uh, Minister. Well, uh, Acting uh, Deputy President, I'm um, you know, soothed by the mellifluous tones of Senator Dunning's uh, uh, reassuring uh, uh, assertion of the opposition's support for this bill. Uh, I intend to make a much shorter contribution. It wasn't even disturbed by—if uh, by, by, uh, you listen carefully to Senator Rice's contribution, we can look forward to a Greens Party amendment. Uh, 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 later on, uh, but, uh, but confident of the support of the Senate for this important piece of legislation, I'll take my seat.
Thank you, Minister. Now, the question before the Senate is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. Oh, I think the noes have it. Aye. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. Lock the doors. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. Uh, 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 the ayes shall pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I shall appoint Senator McKim to tell it for the ayes, Senator O'Sullivan to tell it for the noes.
Order. Order. The result of the division is ayes 15, noes 25. So the motion is decided in the negative. All right. The question now is that the bill be read a third time. Uh, the second time, sorry. I'm getting all excited with that early finish. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Against no. All the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and veterans entitlements and for related purposes. Yes, does anyone require a committee stage? Otherwise I shall call the minister for the third reading. Nobody? Minister. Thank you. I move that the bill be read a third time. The question is the bill now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and veterans entitlements and for related purposes. Minister. I move that the Senate do now adjourn. The question is the Senate now adjourn. Does the opinion say aye? No. Against? Hey. Just, just, just before we go, colleagues, hang on. The Senate now stands adjourned. And we'll meet again on Monday, the 28th of November at 10 a.m. Thank you.